Thank you, uh, Joel. Thank you all for being here today. I know many of you have come long distances, and uh, I know also that you are leaders. You are the good guys in your communities, in foster care, in our welfare systems, in all kinds of activities that essentially help children. And I am very pleased and honored to be working on this issue with uh, Congresswoman Bass, who is a leader in the House and in her state, and with Senator Rob Portman, who is my co-chair of the human trafficking, anti-human trafficking task force in the United States Senate. This caucus was created in November 2012 to really fill a vacuum in the Senate in terms of focusing on this issue of human trafficking. Obviously, most Americans think of human trafficking as something that happens in distant lands, far away, and it does. A lot of it happens in places whose names we can barely pronounce. But it also happens on United States military bases in those faraway countries, and that's the reason that we supported an amendment to the last National Defense Authorization Act that actually penalized contractors for hiring or using labor that was involved in human trafficking, exploiting human trafficking, so as to lower the cost of their contracts, but at the same time, obviously, raising the cost in human terms. And it's also the reason that we have focused on other activities abroad. But right here in the United States, human trafficking is also a problem, and particularly involving exploitation of children, sex trafficking, this subject is one that often is invisible because the victims are voiceless, too young, uh, too fragile, too vulnerable to raise complaints and come to law enforcement authorities. I was a law enforcement authority for many years before coming here, attorney general of my state for 20 years and a federal prosecutor as United States attorney for four and a half years. I know about this topic. It is the ugly, dark side of American life, unacknowledged and often invisible. And sometimes it is coupled with systems that are supposed to care for people, our welfare and foster care systems where children can occasionally fall through the cracks or they may be discovered to be involved in human trafficking when they are taken into foster care. So uh, you are really an incredibly important resource in this fight against human trafficking. You are the folks who have firsthand knowledge and expertise that we need in this effort. And I can't tell you how grateful I am for the work that you do in saving children and also informing us about what we can do better. I'll just close by saying one of my frustrations in the two plus years that I've been in this job in the United States Senate has been the gridlock, the paralysis that results from all of the partisan fighting. You see it as well as we. And I know it's a source of huge frustration, not only for those of us in this place, but also for the American people. Why can't you get something done? That's the refrain I hear again and again and again. I suspect that if you were talking to me individually, you, you'd ask it yourself. And you know, the answer is on the headline items, very difficult to get things done. But there is enormous potential for bipartisan cooperation on an issue like this one. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, partisan or political in terms of Republican, Democrat about trying to save children from human trafficking. And so I think there is the potential. Rob Portman, who is a Republican from Ohio, uh, and I formed this because we saw the potential for bringing people together. And in fact, the caucus in the United States Senate has both Republicans and Democrats because there really is nothing partisan. So I hope that we can muster support, raise awareness through this kind of 
session and also galvanize and organize people to focus on this issue because it is so profoundly important. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you to our presenters and thank you to Congresswoman Bass, whom I now have the privilege to introduce to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome everyone here today and just say that uh, I am very appreciative to the Senator's leadership as he uh, leaves us, but I, I just want to pick up right where he left off, which is, um, you know, unfortunately, the news doesn't really want to cover it when we get along and when we get things done. And, uh, and this absolutely is a bipartisan issue, and it's been uh, my excitement and pleasure to work on this issue in Congress and to know that there's so much support, because I actually feel like we will be able to get something done. And I appreciate everybody for taking the time out today, and especially my judge from uh, Los Angeles, Judge Nash, and his leadership over many, many years. Um, you know, I know that uh, I believe tomorrow, HHS is going to come out with their guidelines for child welfare agencies, and I'm looking forward to seeing that. I'm also excited that this is a, a big priority uh, with the administration as well. So I know you saw the president come out a few months ago, and we want to continue to encourage the White House that this, to me, is a, a real important issue, letting them understand how it is bipartisan, and that it's one of those things that in the midst of all the grid light, gridlock, let's focus on what we can get done. I do have a, a piece of legislation that is moving forward, and I hope to get uh, support on that, and that is looking at sex trafficking and child welfare agencies and making sure that they have all of the resources and support that they need so that the folks that work, the social workers and other people that encounter uh, the girls and the boys, because I'm also concerned about some of the foster boys who I believe uh, wind up being forced into both sides of it, either being trafficked or being one of the traffickers. And uh, I want to make sure that we really focus on all of our vulnerable youth and prevent this uh, from ever happening or prevent it from continuing. So I just want to welcome you. I look forward to listening to at least the first panel before I get pulled away. But my staff member who is in charge of this, Jenny Wood, will be there carrying on uh, the rest of the day. So thank you very much for taking the time out today to focus on such an important issue. Well, thanks everyone for coming and thank you, Congressmember Bass. My name is Jenny Wood and I have the honor of helping to coordinate the Congressional Caucus on Foster Youth. And um, we have at this point just surpassed the 100 mark. So over 100 members have um, acknowledged and say, I want to improve outcomes for foster youth. So hopefully a few other members uh, throughout the day will be coming by and sharing their thoughts on this particular topic. And a few other members of the caucus actually have bills on this very particular intersection. But let's keep the program moving. We're happy to say we're actually ahead of schedule. So thanks to you all for being on time and here in the room with us. I think we fixed all the technical glitches so our colleagues that are uh, watching from home on their computers or in their offices can hear us and see us, just so you know when you ask your questions. We are on live stream today. But uh, we're going to go ahead and move into our next uh, portion of our day, which is really looking at the landscape of this issue and talking about um, some of the statistics that we're seeing across the country. We first have a quick video, and then we have three presenters that will help us better understand the landscape. So let's go ahead and go to the video. I just thought I was so madly in love with him, and he just made me feel safe. Like, you know, I didn't have a dad figure, so he became my dad, and like, I loved him too. The average was fifteen hundred a night, and if I didn't get it, he'd take wooden bats, hit me, um, lamps, anything he could pick up and hit me with, he'd do it. I thought he loved me, and then he turns around and beat me. Twelve other girls in our house. Yeah, 
That's why I call him Daddy Daycare. Like, it's the daycare center. You just can't get up and leave. Like, y'all can get up and go for work. You, it's just like, you can't get up and leave. Like, he had threatened me about my family. He knew where I lived, you know? So it was like, I was afraid of them getting hurt. So I just stayed. Instantly fell in love with him. He knew that I didn't have a dad. I didn't have a daddy. Used that in order to gain control over my mind and, and eventually my actions, uh, showing me that he loved me and giving me things that I had never had before. They move you away from your family. They move you away from anybody who could care for you or rescue you or even see that perhaps you are in a bad situation. And they completely engage you in what's called the game or the life so that things that would make other people's skin crawl turn out to be normal occurrences to you. And at that point, you are completely dominated by this person. You do belong to this person. I knew I was in a situation that I was not in control of. I knew I was in a situation where I was being exploited, where I was being beat, where I was being raped, where I was being tortured for the commercial gain of another human being. I was definitely not free. <laughs> that is not a, a situation where one is free. The crux of my childhood growing up was that my parents didn't love me. The specifics include physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. My parents trafficking me and selling me for sex. The official trafficking began when I was 10. My parents had already terrified me, so I wasn't going to directly tell somebody, because if I got caught, then I didn't know what was going to happen to me. I remember in the third grade, I wrote my teacher a letter. And I didn't say explicitly that they were abusing me, but I said, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make it to the third grade and fourth grade and fifth grade and sixth grade and seventh and eighth and ninth and tenth and eleventh and twelfth. And I wrote every grade out. And I said, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I'm going to make it. And I remember she chuckled because I was this straight A student and she was, she was taking it as if I meant I'm not going to succeed or something. I was uh, 13 or 14. We went to his mother's house and the two girls, the two older, the two women that he had with him in the car when he picked me up um, began to prep me for what was to come. The older girl, she um, kind of walked me through what, how it would go, what I was supposed to do with the money, when I was supposed to get the money, how much I was supposed to charge, and what to expect, and told me that I should um, have a lot of alcohol in me, that it may be hard, but it, that it would get easier. And, um, and, and I did that. I was shaped like a boy, very stringy, very thin, very underdeveloped. It flabbergasts me that that um, that it was okay, you know, that that they that the people who were coming to buy us, the Johns, if you will, that they 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 knew that I was a child. I was recruited into sexual exploitation at the age of 10 years old. He, he provided a lot of attention. He seemed like he was very courteous and sweet. He wanted me to have a good time. He told me he wanted me to dress in the flyest clothes. He wanted me to have the best things. Um, a lot of the, the things that people, you know, call selling a dream, that's what I got. Things I thought were gonna be good with him, but it didn't take me long to realize that he was a very violent person. He was addicted to crack cocaine. And he snorted all day long. So I, I learned early that he needed to have his drug money or my face was gonna be in the wall. So I feel the most difficult part of my victimization was the sense of hopelessness. All right, well, now that we've heard a little bit from the voices of survivors and those that were working so hard uh, to help 
uh, strengthen and empower um, and prevent uh, from occurring to other folks. We'll go ahead and move into our first three presenters. First, we have Malika Sadar Sar, who is the Executive Director of Human Rights Project for Girls. And um, she has been a tremendous advocate and champion for this particular issue, working across various government entities as well as in the community and really working to lift up the voices of survivors. So Malika, come on up. Um, and then uh, also if we can have uh, the other members of our first section, Judge Nash and Jatane Hart come up here as well. And we'll do introductions of you as soon as Malika's done. And then as those um, folks have come into the room uh, and, and uh, are sitting in the back, we do want to make sure that everyone is um, comfortable and has a, a place to write if you'd like to take notes. So if you have a seat next to you at a round table, could you raise your hand? Um, so if those folks who are interested in moving up can go ahead and do so, um, we invite you to, to do that now as our, our panel is getting settled. OK, excellent. Okay, and we'll go ahead and have Malika come forward and present. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see so many of you here, um, and especially so many of you from the child welfare community. Um, I have worked alongside of you in so many of the tremendous ways that we have made better the child welfare legislation, reforms, and systems, and I think today is a powerful moment to think about the next iteration of child welfare reform and movement that lies ahead of us. Just want to quickly give some broad numbers around the issue of domestic child trafficking. And then I want to go into some of the girls' stories that surface for you this intersection between being trafficked and being child welfare involved and then proceed to talk about what goes wrong in the child welfare system for these children and where are the opportunities for improvement and where are the examples of powerful innovation that we can advance. So what we know, and it's not enough, is that according to the Department of Justice, there are up to 250,000 American children at risk for exploitation and trafficking. The majority of those children are girls and between the ages of 12 and 14. These are stats that are back from 2001 and there is a tremendous need to have more research and tracking of the actual numbers. But that is what we know now and there's a need to know so much more in terms of how many children in the US, American born, are being bought and sold. But there's this space, right? There's this space in which so many of those children who are being trafficked within the US are coming out of the child welfare system. Many of us already know this, right? To give more understanding, I want to raise up the stories of three girls, all of whom were first in the foster care system and then trafficked because of their vulnerability in the foster care system. The first girl is Jackie. And she wrote a narrative of her own experience. And she writes, I was put into foster care, into a home, and I regret living there. I was forced to perform sexual lewd acts by my foster care mom's 12 and 13 year old sons. They would hide a camera in my room and videotape me naked and come in my room and touch me at night. Her husband followed soon after. When I let this be known, my foster care mom called me a liar, punched my head into the surface of the wall, and told me to go about my business. I ran away. A pimp found me at a bus stop and bought and sold me through the rest of my teenage years. 
And then there's the story of Tina, who was born into the foster care system and placed into 14 different foster care homes and congregate care settings. She was raped in at least half of those foster care placements. At the age of 10, she met a trafficker, a pimp, who promised to take care of her, to love her, and to shelter her. She was trafficked from 10 to 17, all through California, all through Washington State and Nevada. And then there's the story of Aviva. And Aviva was actually here at the Capitol last week talking to lawmakers about her story. And if you can imagine a girl who is small and slight, who's 17 years old and looks even younger, who when she talks during small conversation at lunch or dinner, talks about Disney movies and the fact that she loved princesses. And Aviva, when she was here, talked about and powerfully and courageously talked about how she was placed into foster care at the age of two. She was raped in foster care by the age of seven. And at the age of 13, she wanted to run away to see her sister. And when she did, she was kidnapped by a trafficker who kept her hostage in his apartment for eight months, selling her to men every single day. And when she told us what the conditions of her repeated rape were like, how she was living, she talked about how she felt like there was no point to even putting on her underwear, how she felt like she had lost her sense of being human, that she felt as if she were nothing more than a dog. These girls' stories talk to that intersection. And many of these girls talk about how they feel that foster care was the training ground for being trafficked. And I want to raise up T's voice here. You saw her on, on the video. And T is a very well-known survivor leader. She's on our board. She's done many things with Congresswoman Bass. I think is going to take over Congresswoman Bass's po position at some point, or at least become her shadow um, until she does that. And T did an interview where she started talking about, and this was to Nick Kristoff, she said, you know, in so many ways, foster care prepared me to be trafficked because I understood very early on that I was connected to a check. I understood very early on that there was a duality between being cared for and being raped. And most importantly, I went from home to home and didn't feel loved. But this pimp, when he came into my life, at least he told me he loved me, which I never heard in the other foster care homes. And I put all of these narratives out there not to wholeheartedly dismiss and condemn the foster care system, and not to say in any way that foster care parents and their families are sexual predators who are out to hurt children. All of us who have done the work around foster care reform, we know that foster care can save lives, and we know that so many people who step up to be foster care parents are angels, and yet there's also this reality. And we have to be able to speak to this reality. And we have to be able to acknowledge the sexual abuse, especially that girls and boys are enduring in the foster care homes, and that when it happens, 
it is too often the story of Jackie, where the girl tries to tell and nobody listens. I have to admit to you that I have heard story upon story of girls talking about being in foster care and being raped. And yet in so many of our child welfare meetings and discussions around how do we reform the system, we do not talk about girls' added vulnerability when they walk into a stranger's home. We do not talk about the asymmetrical power relationships that play out when a girl goes into that foster care home and can be hurt. So I think it's important to speak to that so that we understand better the added vulnerability that girls have and that we understand better why these girls, why these children would be so vulnerable to being trafficked because of their involvement in foster care. In so many ways, they are a manifestation of what is broken in our child welfare system. And in those spaces of brokenness, in those spaces of multiple placements in foster care, in those spaces of failed congregate care settings, in those spaces of sexual abuse in foster care homes, there's the trafficker. There's the pimp who is there to find her immediately, to either lure her or coerce her or kidnap her. And it is in that space that we have to be able to look at interventions. So from a place of the numbers, not only the stories, but the numbers, when we do have child welfare systems that want to better understand where the girls are who are being trafficked and are starting to identify and assess trafficked children in their child welfare systems, here's what we do know from a number perspective. We know that in 2012, Connecticut reported 88 victims of sex trafficking, 86 were child welfare involved, and most reported abuse while in foster care or residential placement. In Alameda County, California, a one-year review of local CSEC, commercial sexual exploitation, exploitation victim populations, found that 55% were from foster youth group homes and 82% had previously run away from multiple homes. In Florida, the FBI reports that an estimated 70% of victims identified in Florida are foster youth. We need more numbers, we need more tracking, we need more documentation, but those few states that have been able to look at who the children are who are being trafficked are clearly able to show, to surface, this real connection between child welfare and trafficked children. Part of why we are seeing this play out is because there are so many ways in which the child welfare system, like the juvenile justice system, don't really understand the girl in front of them, right? So, so many of the child welfare caseworkers look at these girls and think, you know, they're really angry girls. And they're really very system-involved girls. And they're difficult girls. And in some cases, they're girls gone wild. I was in a meeting where I had some of the best child welfare advocates in the state with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And the, the child welfare workers talked about these girls with real compassion, but they talked about them as, as bad girls, right? As really difficult girls to try to figure out and handle, as girls who have gone through all the systems, runaway youth, shelter, juvenile justice, multiple placements. And I will never forget how Carolyn Atwell from NICMIC just looked at them and said, you realize these girls are also victims of crime. There was not, until that moment, a recognition that, yes, these girls are victims of repeated child rape. It's too easy to dismiss them as bad girls and system-involved girls. It's critical that, instead, there be a recognition 
that these girls are victims of crime. But it's not simply the mindset of child welfare workers to be able to truly see the girls as victims. It's also about how do we reframe the child welfare system from a structural place to be able to see the girls. Because right now, most child welfare systems are not identifying and assessing for trafficking, right? Most child welfare hotlines are not coded for the allegation of human trafficking. And most child welfare systems will not get involved because the abuser is not a caretaker or a guardian. The abuser is often a stranger, is often the trafficker, is the pimp. And because most often the trafficker, the pimp, is not a caretaker or guardian, child welfare does not see a role for itself. And so those are fundamental structural ways in which the child welfare system does not see the girl trafficked in front of it, and fundamental ways in which we cannot do effective intervention and prevention because we do not have those critical structural pieces to be able to see the children and effectively intervene. And we have to change that. And why do we have to change that? Why is that so critical? I mean, I, I can feel in the room many of us who, who think there's so much that child welfare is already expected to do, and there's not the funding nor the capacity to be able to respond to more needs. It is an overwhelmed and underfunded system, a system that is so dysfunctional in so many aspects. How now are we supposed to talk about making it better around the issue of trafficking? It is another expectation that this system cannot take on. But here's the thing. If we don't do that, then these children are not seen as victims of abuse. The child welfare system exists in order for the state to recognize, intervene, provide assistance for abused and neglected children. These girls are that. And when we don't see them that way, then they are the criminal, then they are the bad girl, and then they are displaced into the juvenile justice system. And so when child welfare turns its back on these girls, they are displaced into JJ. And that route of being criminalized for being raped repeatedly is unjust. And our children deserve more. And so it is absolutely imperative because of who we are as child welfare advocates, because of what we believe the child welfare system is supposed to do because we fight every day against abuse and neglect, that we see these girls who are being exploited and trafficked in the South Bronx, in Miami, in Ohio, in Indiana, that these girls, all of them, are victims of child abuse, that exploitation and trafficking is a form of child abuse and rape and violence. And fortunately, there are the visionaries among us and the champions among us who have already begun to go in that direction, right? And that's promising because we know then that it's possible to be able to pivot the child welfare system towards these needed changes of seeing the girls, of seeing the boys and the girls, the children, as victims of child rape and violence. And so Connecticut, without any added funding, has trained all of its child welfare workers and counselors to understand the issue of domestic child trafficking and what are appropriate interventions and case management services. In Connecticut, Illinois, and Florida, there is the specific recognition of human trafficking as a form of child maltreatment and abuse. And that recognition allows for effective case management and services. And in Connecticut, I'm sorry to raise up Connecticut so much, but in Connecticut we also have the example of um, playing with the definition of caretaker and guardian, right? 
So they have changed the language of that to also include an adult who's, who has a child under his or her control. And that change, that expansion, allows a more clear, relevant, resonant role for child welfare. There's also the examples that we're seeing across the country of using therapeutic foster care as a way of providing help for these girls. Many of these girls cannot be returned <clears throat> to group settings, cannot be returned to the traditional foster care, and cannot be returned to their own families. And so there's really critical work going on in places like California and in Washington and in California's uh, Alameda County especially, of being able to use therapeutic foster care as a way of giving safety and shelter and protection to the girls. I think there is so many more ways that we can look at different counties and states, child welfare systems, really trying to be able to address the, dis the distinct needs of these girls, of these children. It is hopeful to me that this is being done my greater hope is that we can take those examples and we can bring them to scale. The opportunity here today is to hear more about those innovative examples of child welfare and trafficking intersections and innovative programs that are being done at that intersection. But I think this is also a clarion call to our community, to the child welfare community, that we take a leadership role in identifying and claiming these children as ours, and that we take all of what we need to move forward and to reframe and expand the child welfare system to be responsive to these children and to understand that these children are in fact absolutely victims of abuse, neglect, and violence. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Malika. Now we're gonna have Judge Michael Nash from Los Angeles come up and share a bit about what is happening in courtrooms throughout the country, some of the gaps and challenges that we're seeing inside the courtroom and beyond. And uh, in addition to being the lead judge in the juvenile court system in LA, Judge Nash is also the president of the National Council of juvenile and family court judges. So he's going to speak both about what's going on locally as well as throughout the entire country. Judge Nash. Good morning, everybody. As you've heard, I've been a, I'm a juvenile court judge and I have been for about 23 and a half years. Um, and I serve as the presiding judge in uh, Los Angeles County, which has the largest juvenile court system uh, in, in the country with 44 dependency and delinquency courts serving approximately 50,000 children, youth, and their families under our court's jurisdiction. I often refer to myself as the feel-good judge when I talk to you folk, to, to folks because when they realize what we have to deal with in Los Angeles, they feel a lot better about what they have to deal with in their other jurisdictions. I'm also the current president of the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. Uh, the National Council is the nation's uh, oldest judicial membership organization with approximately 2,000 members, uh, mostly uh, uh, juvenile and family court judges. Our organization was formed to provide education, technical assistance, and, and do research for judges and others who work in our courts and our nation's child welfare and juvenile justice systems. Um, we also uh, often when we have the opportunity to weigh in on matters of policy uh, impacting children and families who are involved with, with, our, with, with our systems. The subject matter of this forum is, is, is one of those issues. Um, it's very important and relevant to our work, as you can imagine, because so many of the victims uh, are or have been involved with either or both our child welfare system uh, and the juvenile justice system. And of course, of course you know, our judges uh, play a very important role in both, and it's important uh, at some point that we get it right. Uh, in February of this year, uh, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges uh, passed a resolution uh, calling for 
uh, judicial action to address the growing problem of domestic minor human sex trafficking. And uh, in this re resolution, we recognized uh, the following facts. Uh, first, that, and similar to what Malika just said, between 100,000 and 300,000 youth uh, in this country are at risk for commercial, commercial sexual exploitation every year. Um, the average age of the entry of uh, into the commercial sex industry is 12 to 14 for girls, 11 to 13 uh, for boys and transgender youth. The gender uh, of most of the uh, victims uh, of uh, sexual exploit of sex trafficking is female, but um, there are a significant number of boys who are impacted by this as well. Also, we recognize that between 70 and 90 percent of commercially sexually exploited youth have a history of child sexual abuse. Um, and also, uh, we recognize that youth who are, have had contact with or, or are involved with the child welfare system are at a higher risk for commercial sexual exploitation. Um, as you heard, we don't have great data uh, on this, but in Los Angeles, approximately 77% of the youth charged with prostitution-related offenses have had prior contact with our Department of Children and Family Services. And um, it's very common uh, for traffickers to specifically target youth shelters, group homes, and foster care facilities as uh, locations for the recruitment uh, of vulnerable foster youth. Um, we also know that, that youth who are commercially sexually exploited suffer negative long-term psychological, social, uh, and physical impacts. Also, approximately 1.6 children, so 1.6 million children run away from home every year in the United States, and of course, these children are at high risk of child sexual exploitation due to their variety of vulnerabilities. And once again, even though we do not have great data uh, on this issue, certainly from a national perspective, in Los Angeles, which is a, uh, unfortunately, a major hub for minor sex trafficking in this country, uh, our numbers indicate that there is a very high disproportionate, disproportionate minority contact among the victims of domestic child, child uh, sex trafficking, and I'm sure that uh, um, most of you would agree with that notion. Uh, 39 states uh, across the nation um, uh, have criminalized this behavior. And uh, we also believe in our organization that the juvenile justice system is ill-equipped to handle cases of commercially sexual, sexually exploited youth due to the often limited services and placement options. So we've recommended a number of things. Uh, first, uh, our organization, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, uh, opposes the criminalization of child sex, sexual of uh, victims of child sexual exploitation, and supports uh, state laws that decriminalize that behavior. Um, our, our our organization also uh, says that we want to promote the development of specialized services and resources for the victims. Um, from the child welfare system, the delinquency system, and within the community. And of course, the services need to include um, uh, non-detention triage facilities and specialized placement options that are equipped to effectively, effectively address the unique trauma suffered by these victims. Our or organization also calls for a coordinated judicial response to decrease the number of children uh, coerced into human trafficking, and this includes uh, creating a network of communication among judges of different jurisdictions. Our organization also calls for a coordinated response to increase the effectiveness of our courts in identifying uh, victims of human trafficking and hoping to extract them from the trade. Uh, we support uh, the exercise of judicial leadership to convene local stakeholder and community groups to improve and enhance system responses to the needs of, of these victims. Um, and also, within the limits of available funding, uh, we believe that we should be collaborating with 
organizations and experts across the nation to develop curricula for trainings intended to better educate the judiciary so that we can uh, appropriately uh, utilize the power that we have from the bench. Uh, since we've passed this resolution, um, there are other things that our organization has been involved with. First, we have received funding from OJJDP to develop uh, training uh, and judicial practice tools to better identify and serve victims. Um, this project will include uh, a, a national convening a round, uh, of a roundtable of judges and others to understand the issue, uh, develop training curricula for judges focused on, on the specific trauma focused by these victims, um, focusing on gender bias, focusing on identification of victims and the creation of, of uh, appropriate treatment plans. We will then offer an intensive judicial institute to train judges about the tools that they can use uh, from the bench to serve these victims. Uh, this summer, in July, at our annual conference in Seattle, which brings together hundreds of judges from across the country, uh, we are offering a, a specific track on domestic sex trafficking, um, including things like how does this issue relate to our juvenile and family courts? Um, what has been the federal and state uh, legislative responses to this issue, and how are judges taking action uh, in this regard? Um, there are also a number of examples of how our courts have begun to address this difficult problem. Uh, later this morning, you'll hear from a judge from Houston who is doing some excellent work. Uh, I want to talk for a couple of minutes about a program that's occurring in Los Angeles County. Through another grant uh, obtained from the California Department of Corrections, uh, the Correction Standard Authority utilizing funds received from OJJDP, our delinquency court has created a collaborative court called the STAR Court, which stands for Succeeding Through Achievement and Resilience. Uh, this STAR Court works with uh, young people who are involved in or at risk for prostitution. The court provides intensive, uh, generally weekly uh, supervision by a judicial officer, probation officers, uh, edu advocates, and counselors uh, to monitor the youth's progress. Our court is working with the probation department to develop better placement and counseling uh, services to assist these victims, specifically taking into account their, their prior trauma and alienation from healthy communities and families. The court has also worked with our prosecutors and public defenders to develop a diversion program to allow uh, these youth to earn dismissals of the charges. Um, um, our hope, of course, is to reduce the amount of time these youth are detained, reduce recidivism, and provide these victims with the skills to transition to a successful adulthood. We currently have about 75 young people in this program, um, which really only serves a small portion of our, of our county. Ultimately and ideally, we'd like to expand this program to other parts of our county, but we need more placements for these youth, which can provide specialized services. In addition, we're attempting to work with others to obtain, track, and evaluate the data so that we can understand completely the depth of this problem in Los Angeles and certainly be able to evaluate our program. And if any of you ever find yourself in Los Angeles with some free time, uh, you know, visiting this court um, is really an enlightening experience. And I hope uh, Congresswoman Bass will take the time because the court is located in the south central portion of our county. Um, there, there are other ongoing efforts in Los Angeles and California. Our Board of Supervisors has created a multidisciplinary county uh, task force designed to draft recommendations, um, which, among other things, are to create greater involvement of the child welfare system through our Department of Children and Family Services in dealing with this issue. And, and this task force actually is meeting today, uh, but I chose to be with you. And two days ago, uh, our State Senate Human Services Committee held a hearing similar to this one to help develop policy considerations for the child welfare system. 
Uh, one of the bills being considered is a bill, Senate Bill 738, for those of you who are interested, which contains the following provisions. Uh, and, and the first one, I think, is very significant. And we've heard that there are some states that have already done this. And, and the first this provision is states that a child who is a victim of human trafficking falls specifically within the jurisdiction of our dependency court. This is a child welfare issue, not a juvenile justice issue. Um, this bill also uh, requires um, our state health and human services agency to convene an interagency work group to uh, enact a plan to serve and protect uh, the, these youth, and they must have some recommendations by January of next year. This bill also requires, once again, pointing to, to uh, uh, the, the, the child welfare side, requires our, our child welfare council, which I believe is an entity that was created by Congresswoman Bass when she was in our state legislature and, to, and before she took her talents uh, to the national level. And, um, and in fact, our, our, uh, our child welfare council recently um, uh, published this, uh, th th this uh, report ending the commercial sex exploit exploitation uh, of children, a call for multi-system collaboration in California. And I, I have sent this to uh, Congresswoman Bass uh, previously. Um, but once again, the, the, the legislation calls for involvement with the child welfare side in the developing, development of this plan. And, and the last important thing from, from this legislation is that it will require training uh, for group homes, for foster parents, uh, relatives, and non-relative extended family member caregivers to include instruction on cultural competency and sensitivity relating to and best practices for providing adequate care to sexually exploited and trafficked minors in out-of-home care. Um, there's a lot more going on, but I think these are, are significant efforts, at least moving in the right direction. Um, our organization, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, uh, really looks forward to working with many of you in this room, working with Congress uh, and other federal agencies to help uh, eliminate this terrible problem because we still have so much to do. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to be here today. Thank you, Judge Nash. Now we're going to turn to Jatane Hart, who is not only uh, currently with the Office of Youth Empowerment at the DC Child and Family Services Agency, but also uh, one of the leaders that serves on the National Foster Care Youth and Alumni Policy Council, which is an entity that provides feedback directly from foster youth and alumni to various federal policymakers, including our next presenter, Assistant Secretary George Sheldon. So Jatane, come on up. She's gonna be presenting on an, uh, some findings of a vulnerability study of foster youth and alumni and uh, how it intersects with today's topic. Good morning. Thank you so much, Jenny. I'm so honored to be here this morning and really just thankful and grateful to have a forum, to have a really meaningful conversation about the interrelatedness of child welfare and um, human trafficking and sexual exploitation. I'm thanking everybody in the audience for really caring about this issue and for wanting to be a part of, you know, the change and creating a, a space that's youth are protected and feel safe um, in the child welfare system. And so, as Jenny said, my name is Jatane Hart. Um, I experienced foster care and aged out of foster care in California. Um, I spent nine years in care there um, in a rural community. Um, and I currently um, am working with Office of Youth Empowerment. Um, I have dedicated my whole career, I can't say it's very long, but my whole career to child welfare and improving the system and improving the outcomes for young people in care. And I am really excited to be part of the council um, and get to represent them here today um, as a member. 
Um, and just so the council was created in 2012, in the very beginning of 2012, um, at the request of the administration, really um, to provide a, a space for um, alumni and current foster youth to really come together and create recommendations and to provide information on policies and practices that are in place and how we can really support and to better improve um, young people in, in foster care. Um, we currently have about 20 uh, I, would, I can't say young people because when we look at the scope, we have young people who are 18 and we have some who are in their 40s. And so it really is a combination of people who've experienced care um, for a long time. Um, but there's 20 members of the council and really coming from lots of different backgrounds and different expertise and really um, very, very bright um, when you get us all in the room trying to come up with recommendations we all are so passionate about all of our areas it's very interesting to see but um, we come together twice a year um, to really do in-person uh, development of recommendations based on areas that we find kind of maybe really kind of hot topics or things that we are really passionate about and so we've developed thus far I think about eight different areas of recommendations um, with um, impacting child welfare from education and aging out. Um, we did a, a five ideas, just a kind of quick start um, of the council. And vulnerability was one of the areas that we focused on. And um, in, in kind of developing our recommendations, we really wanted to get an idea because we are an alumni policy council, we wanted to get feedback from both young people in care as well as you know people around the country who were, had experienced the system and maybe they hadn't been experienced sexual exploitation or they hadn't been human trafficked, but really get an idea of kind of what that looked like for young people. And so we conducted a study um, using our uh, stakeholders and partner organizations to really kind of help um, get responses. And we got a lot of um, great um, qualitative um, feedback from young people and I would love you know because of the sensitivity and you know these young people really taking the time to share that and be vulnerable we really didn't want to present that and put that up but I wanted to share some of the highlights of that I um, mean a lot of that was very similar to what Malik Malika sorry and um, Judge Nash had said in terms of you know foster youth being very vulnerable and so um, I think that one of the Striking things is, you know, is that 70% of our respondents had experienced or been approached for inappropriate sexual advances while in foster care. And for me, this really strikes a chord um, because, so I wasn't sexually exploited and I wasn't human trafficked, but I grew up in foster care. And as I was answering these questions myself, I realized just how vulnerable I was. Some of the behaviors that I was partaking in and some of the things that I was doing was, you know, for a long time really thought it was because of my behavior, it was because of who I was and I didn't have the right values and realized that it wasn't because I was this person but because I hadn't been taught the right things that I'd been put into a system that didn't teach me or protect me and teach me how to protect myself. And so, you know, 70% of young people not even being aware of the fact that they're in a situation where they're vulnerable and where they are easily a target to people who, you know, are predators. Um, the other, um, one of the other significant things was that a lot of young people, I guess it was 40% were um, approached by, or while they were in foster care. And um, particularly one in every four women had been, or girls had been approached by a caregiver or a foster parent. And that's, I mean, that's, and thinking about what Malika had said, and really, you know, we young people come into a stranger's home where they're supposed to be protected, where they're, you know, they have been removed from their family because of abuse, and then they placed into another home where they're expected to feel safe, and then to kind of re-traumatize um, re and provide, and have more abuse is really just difficult. And so I think for me, that really just, knowing having been in six different homes and some of the behaviors that happened in those homes as well, going, whoa, you know, it wasn't just one in four young people is a lot and a high number um, that really needs to change. And then we talk a lot about, you know, the number of girls and things like that, but our males um, are really at, at risk as well. And I think what's hard for young males is that they are ashamed 
um, to a different degree than young women. Um, I think young women are very, and we, we heard how, how ashamed and how hard it is to report, but young men tend to um, not know how to do that as well. Um, we found that 89% of the young men in our um, survey, who participated in our survey did not know how and would not report um, any kind of sexual um, abuse or advances as well. And, um, and then we also found that 86% of the young people who um, had witnessed domestic violence or been um, victims of domestic violence. And so just thinking about you know getting into relationships and getting into situations, and I wouldn't even say relationships, but getting into situations where that is happening and that's the norm for them. That's how they grew up. That's what their fam they saw in their families. And so it's, not, it's, a, it's repeating what they've already learned rather than, you know, and so they haven't been protected. Um, and so based on these recommend or these kind of responses and our survey um, kind of information, we came up with eight different recommendations. Um, and I want to highlight three. Um, and they kind of, some of them are very specific to human trafficking and some of them are a little bit more broad, but when we think about protecting young people against vulnerability, we want to really be preventative um, and teaching young people um, to protect themselves. And for, so the first one actually is about criminalizing the act of having a known sex offender in your home as a foster parent or a, care, a facility. Um, when you do the initial background check and all of that, all adults in your house have to have you know, their fingerprints and criminal check, but what happens once that's done? You know, people, families willingly knowing that their their son or their uncle or their significant other has some kind of sexual um, inappropriateness and has had been a sexual offender being allowed into that home. And so we really, as a council, thought this was a really strong way of saying that this is inappropriate and this is something that can be done. Um, and on piggybacking on that, we wanted to include additional home visits and drop in home visits because when we tell, when a social worker tells a family they're coming, it's easy to get rid of all the extra people in a home so it looks normal. But if you're doing drop in visits, then you're able to, you know, kind of surprise them and kind of see what's really happening. And so that was really important as um, a council. The other part is the idea of educating us um, about the, the impact that our, our past abuse can have on. Um, on us um, continually throughout our lives. And you know, it's, it's one thing to deal with the trauma when it happens and talk about the trauma and try to help a young person process, but not talking about how that experience will then can then impact them later in life. And so we really ask that young people are educated about the impact that um, abuse has and how it can make them vulnerable so that they have the, the intelli emotional intelligence to really protect themselves as well um, when the system may not be able to do that. And then the last recommendation I want to highlight is the idea of um, is being able to report. I, I think across the board, young people said they didn't know how to report, they didn't know where to report, they were afraid to report. You know, if it was a foster parent, they were afraid that they were going to have to go to another house, and you don't know if you're going to go into another home where abuse is going to happen. And so, really providing a safe space for young people and a youth friendly space for young people to report and feel that it's safe to do so. Um, I, I, and I, I don't share this often, but um, when I was in high school, I was, I was out, I was at a party, and a young man made advances on me. Um, we were in a room, and I was, it was, said no, but didn't, he didn't listen, and I went home that night, and I, you know, I, my friends had been there, no one said anything, I went home and didn't say anything, because I was afraid that my foster parents were gonna think that it was because of my behaviors, that I had been exhibiting that I had attracted it to me. And to think about that and say, oh my gosh, I, you know, to not be able to report something, a crime, I mean, it's a crime, and not to feel safe enough to report that to the people who are supposed to be protecting you is a really, really big deal. And so I think that we really have to create that space for young people to do that. Um, with that said, I, I, it was very interesting because I say that I wasn't, you know, I didn't experience sexual exploitation and I didn't get human trafficked, but about a month ago, I was um, out in the community. I, I just moved from California and was in Oakland, and I, um, this gentleman came up to me and said, oh, I remember you. We went to college together, and we started talking, and he's like, yeah, I remember this about you, and he was remembering all of the crazy things that I did, and I was like, oh, gosh. Um, but what he told me was, as we started talking more, he was like, yeah, you know, I'm a pimp, and I was, I had this moment, and, 
you know, and he, he thought it was cool, but I, I had to stop and go, oh my gosh, the fact that he, those are the things that he remembered about me and the fact that those are the things that I was doing, how easily I could have been part of the, you know, could have been turned by him. And the, it, it was scary. It was very scary to know, you know, particularly as an educated woman who, you know, pretty much had a lot of things going for myself that I easily could have been put into that situation. And then thinking about young people who aren't and who don't have some of that knowledge base and don't have some of the self-confidence that I, you know, that I do have. And so um, I just it's I just leave you with the idea that, yes, as a system, we have to do better to protecting our young people. But we also have to do better at teaching our young people how to protect themselves and how to. Um, speak up when um, when things do happen. So thank you. You're terrific. God bless you. Thank you, Jatane. Those are really powerful words, and really appreciate your courage in sharing such personal stories. We now have the pleasure of bringing up another member of the Congressional Caucus on Foster Youth, a new member of Congress from San Diego. Uh, he is uh, a champion on these issues, actually just introduced a bill uh, to help prevent child trafficking. So without fur any further ado, uh, let's welcome Congressman Juan Vargas. Thank you very much. It is an honor to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Chetane, thank you for your, your courage to come up here and to share with us. We appreciate it. I appreciate it very much. It's hard to do, I know. <laughs> uh, my name is Juan Vargas. I represent the border area of California, literally the entire border from the ocean all the way to Arizona, a, a very large area where a lot of trafficking, unfortunately, happens. A lot of foster youth, of course, are trafficked there, but also a lot of undocumented youth, too, that are brought uh, from Mexico and other places as, as young as 10, 12 years old. And, and one of the things I think the, the system does very badly is re-victimize often the victims. So you'll have this uh, young person who has uh, been forced into to sex trafficking, and then the court, no offense, judge, or anybody else, but the court oftentimes treats that person as a criminal, not as a victim. And oftentimes the law is very harsh on that victim. For example, I've been working with the prosecutors in San Diego, and the, the, the trafficking laws for children require that the government prove that the trafficker, the pimp, knew that the child was a child. Now oftentimes that's incredibly difficult for the youth because he or she Usually she has to sit through the trial, has to do all sorts of things. It's just incredibly difficult. So instead, they usually plead the cases out. Now, we have had in San Diego a, a very brave uh, young woman that came forward. At, uh, she was sex trafficked, and she was able to go through the trial. Very difficult for her, but she did it. And her pimp got 30 years. When they were looking at potentially um, the the... the, the at one point entertaining the, the, the idea that they might uh, not take it to trial, they were looking at maybe two or three years. In fact, I've heard, heard instances where some of these, uh, these traffickers get out before the victim does, is waiting for them. So my law says that the, the law that I am proposing and, uh, and hope that it passes is that the, the government would still have to prove that a person obviously is a sex trafficker, and they'd also have to prove that was, he was sex trafficking children, but he wouldn't have to prove that he knew it. The, the burden of proof would switch, and I think that that's very, very fair. If you're going to be a pimp, if you're going to be a trafficker, you, know, you ought to have uh, tough consequences, and you shouldn't brutalize again and victimize the victim. So that, that's what my law does. But um, I'm really excited about you being here today. I studied to be a Jesuit priest for five years. I worked with a lot of uh, people that were refugees from Central America during the time I was doing this. A lot of kids who had been absolutely brutalized trying to get to the United States from Guatemala through Mexico and arrived in, in Los Angeles where I would go and pick them up off the streets, mostly uh, mothers and their children, uh, usually mothers because their husbands had been murdered in the war. 
and usually the younger, uh, the older boys had been murdered also. So usually there were uh, women with their children and had passed through all the horrors in the world. But then you'd find all these great person, people helping them. I mean, I always found the, the light on, on the, end, the other end of the tunnel in Los Angeles. There were these wonderful people that would take them into their homes and find them jobs, skirting the law a little bit, judging I'm sorry because they weren't documented, but at the same time, we were trying to uh, find asylum for them. And you always found these wonderful people. And that's, uh, that's why I'm sure you are here today, all these wonderful people trying to figure out how to help the foster youth that really need this help. I know Karen and I worked together when we were, Karen Bass, when we were in the Assembly and the Senate together, and I really appreciate all her work, and I'm very excited about working with her here. But I'm also very excited because I know that you guys have the, the heart to do this. I know I've, I've heard, Jatain, I heard your heart to, to help people. You know the situation. So I'm, I'm very thankful for all of you, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here to say, say a few things. If you do have a question or two, I'd be happy to answer. Otherwise, I'll, I'll shut up, sit down, and listen a little more. But uh, I really do appreciate every one of you being here. You always uh, are that light that we always look for. Uh, you know, it's that old notion that there's the darkness out there, and someone has to punch light into it, and that's who you guys are here. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, I'm back. Um, so I'm here to introduce um, Assistant Secretary George Selden, uh, who oversees the administration uh, for children and families at the US Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, many of you know Mr. Sheldon quite well. He formerly was the Secretary of the Florida Department of Children and Families. And uh, during his time there, um, Mr. Sheldon chaired the state's task force on human trafficking with the head of the state Florida Department of Law Enforcement. So this is an issue uh, that he comes with a great degree of knowledge and insight based on his time uh, at the state level. Um, he currently co-chairs the Federal Victim Services Strategic Planning Committee, and I'm delighted to introduce Mr. Sheldon to speak about the guidance and other issues related to this topic, so thank you. Your Honor, great may it please the court. Uh, uh, it, it really is an honor to, to be with you, and, and, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, it, I, it's just the fact that you're here really is a demonstration of, of how important you know this topic to be. Uh, and if you're in this room or whether you're watching this on, on webcast, uh, you really are saying that no longer will we allow the scourge of human trafficking uh, to go unabated. The federal government, the Department of Health and Human Services, other agencies will continue to stand with you. You know this better than I do, but the range of victims defies our sense of humanity. They're young, they're old, boys forced to be soldiers and laborers, girls forced into the sex industry and domestic servitude, men and women coerced in their economic desperation for a job, forced to take jobs unwillingly, jobs that they would never take before, and then forced to live in squalor. You've joined a nationwide movement now to combat and end a modern form of slavery. That we're gathered uh, in the halls of Congress really is a sign that the executive branch and the legislative branch are joined in this effort. And as I've traveled the country, I know that trial judges, juvenile court judges, dependency judges, all over this nation have signed on to that fight as well. And if you want to find an issue that joins political parties, it is this one. I want to take a moment to personally thank uh, Senator Blumenthal, Representative Bass, and her new colleague from, uh, from California. Also, the entire Senate Caucus on Human Trafficking and the House Caucus on Foster Care. I assure you that your steadfast resolve to champion the cause of victims and survivors here in the Congress has not gone unnoticed. The legislature has shown a leadership and an insight 
to be part of this critical fight. Regrettably, right now, traffickers have the upper hand. But I am convinced with the combined efforts of the people in this room and people watching across the country, the tide is turning. We are here today to discuss the many ways in which human trafficking, particularly the commercial sex exploitation of children, intersects with child welfare. And having run a child welfare system so many times, I've heard from folks in child welfare, well, we, we don't do human trafficking, but we do child welfare. And what is more and critical to the welfare of a child than to be free from slavery? The trafficking in children is so incomprehensively vile that it is even difficult to imagine. And yet we see it every day. All across this country, in our towns, in our cities, in our schools, in our group homes, and too many other places. Consider these alarming statistics for a moment. In one report from the Connecticut Department of Children and Families, 86 of 88 children identified as being involved in domestic sex trafficking had been in the child welfare system. And a report judged from Los Angeles Probation Department, 59% of 174 juveniles arrested on prostitution-related charges had been in the foster care system. And while I am among the first to call for more research in this area, these examples show how vulnerable, abused, neglected, and maltreated youth are recruited and controlled by the tactics of human traffickers. These studies and reports clearly indicate just how critical the role of child protection professionals are in identifying victims and helping them to get the services they need. In meeting with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, special agents have identified large high schools, particularly in economically depressed areas, and large group homes, both dependency and delinquency homes, are becoming the new recruiting area for traffickers in this country. Traffickers prey on young boys and girls who seem to be disconnected from the world around them. They're without strong family ties or friends. They're looking for and in need of that connection that assures them that they belong somewhere. It's a need for connection that really makes them vulnerable. We know that it usually appears to start innocently someone reaching out for a friend, someone showing up and saying, I want to be your friend. That young girl believes it's now her boyfriend. And then that one day, that so-called boyfriend says, well, I can't pay the light bill this month. Would you help me out? And then that rapidly evolves into a spiral of abuse where that young girl is forced to sell the most precious thing to her, her human body. These children have lost so much, and some have nowhere really to turn, no one really to trust. And yet, because of the way that our conflicting laws still read, many face convictions and jail time instead of victim services, the services that they rightly deserve. You know, it's as if that somehow it was a personal problem for the unfortunate boy or girl, an issue that really doesn't concern us. Too many ignore those victims and their needs because it's easier to kind of turn away and say it doesn't exist. I believe because of you and others like you, those days are over. I believe that we can no longer allow anyone in this country, and frankly, anyone in this world, to turn their back and say it doesn't exist. The struggle for basic human rights continues in the Senate Caucus on Human Trafficking, the House Caucus on Foster Care, and each of you are among the vanguard. Because of your efforts and those of many more, we're actively making our programs more responsive to the needs of victims who are trapped in these terrible situations. 
The only way that we'll really make a difference, though, is to work together. No one of us, not the federal government, not the states, not individual community agencies, not local organizations, can combat this problem alone. But together, I believe that we truly can turn the tables. Legislators working with the executive branch, judges stepping up to the table, NGOs being part of a solution, and survivors really kind of leading the way. I think now is really the time uh, to harness the movement. It is really time to create what I believe needs to be a continuum of care that provides safe and licensed and supportive shelters. A time to get licensing and policy issues right so that we do not subject trafficking victims to re-abuse. It's time to create therapeutic interventions and services to meet the diverse needs of victims. As you heard in the introduction, I'm from Florida. And as many of you know, Florida has the dubious distinction of ranking near the top in the nation in human trafficking victims, largely because of its tourism, its hospitality, its agricultural industry. The cases really still haunt me. Um, I've seen them far too many times. In one, a Jacksonville man recruited two minors from Virginia for prostitution, promising them lavish vacations in Florida. In another case, an Orlando man met a 17-year-old girl online and promised to make her a star. Instead, he forced her into prostitution in California and Las Vegas, advertising her services on Craigslist. Recently, I visited a center in Chicago called Ann's House, where previously trafficked trafficked women had been given a home and support. There were eight women there. And what really struck me was obviously the fear that their trafficker would find them. But what struck me even more was this beginning belief that do I have any value other than my human body? That will take a long recovery. These women have lost so much. They've lost their dignity. They've lost a productive life. And because they've been so psychologically broken, their recovery will take a lifetime. Last November, survivors of human trafficking addressed the senior leadership at the Administration for Children and Families to tell their stories. What struck me in listening to each one of them was how they had been robbed of their sense of self-worth. They'd been treated as commodities. And over time, they came to see the value, their value, only in terms of their bodies. Just like the women in Chicago. They don't understand it's a crime that's being done to them. It broke my heart to consider what really had been taken from them. Five of those six women had been in the foster care system. Four were trafficked while they were on runaway status. One woman who's now 40 years old was trafficked for only three weeks, she said. But she went on to say that although that seems like a short period of time psychologically. Now, some 25, almost 30 years later, she still is struggling with the psychological scars of those three weeks. But it also was encouraging to me how committed she was to making sure that never happened again to another individual. What really struck me in, in the women in Chicago, what struck me of those six women who came to our leadership at the Administration for Children and Families was really their resilience, their determination to fight back, 
their, their demand that they overcome what they'd gone through. And that is why I believe that survivors have to be at the table when we are discussing, when we're drafting, when we're implementing policies. That is so critical to our success. It is evident that it's very difficult for trafficking victims, however, to come forward and identify themselves, especially if they're very young and vulnerable. No matter whether they're foreign or American citizens, they were usually afraid that ultimately they'll return to that bad situation from which they came. And for all these reasons, they fear reaching out to law enforcement, to health providers, to others who could be in a position to help. What struck me was the need really for greater coordination among federal agencies, state governments, law enforcement, providers. When President Obama announced a government-wide effort to combat human trafficking during his speech last September at the Clinton Global Initiative, he pledged to do even more to help victims recover and rebuild their lives, to develop a new action plan to improve coordination of services across the federal government, to increase access to services and help survivors become self-sufficient. And the federal government is coming together at a greater extent than I believe ever before. As the Department of Justice and Homeland Security, the Department of Health and Human Services, Labor, Transportation, USAID are saying we want to be part of this movement and putting aside their territorial boundaries. Now, other agencies than HHS are charged with the task of hunting down perpetrators and bringing them to justice. But prosecutors will tell you that if they're going to have a successful prosecution, they have to have a willing witness who feels safe and secure. And if you're really coming at it from a law enforcement standpoint, you cannot do it without recognizing what these individuals have been through and the services that they need. So just where are we in terms of responding to the needs of victims? According to the National Human Trafficking Resource Center hotline, shelter is the number one requested service Referral, whether it's a U.S. citizen, whether it's foreign nationals, whether it's adults or children. Over 3,650 survivors of human trafficking have called that national hotline directly, many of whom expressed unique challenges in accessing legal and shelter services due to a lack of identification documents, not meeting residency requirements, other challenges. In many ways, like any fledgling movement, our biggest issue is the capacity to actually address the issues at hand. And that's why we're working with Congress to create new capacity and coordinate to, in order to coordinate anti-trafficking efforts across the operating units within HHS and with our federal partners in state and justice and homeland security and defense and others. As we develop the federal level response and coordination and begin to really coordinate our efforts across programs and, and agencies. We're developing a coordinated government-wide strategic action plan for victim services that outlines our push and provides a structure for others to join us. It is a five-year plan that covers all victims and all forms of human trafficking. The plan was drafted with the help of survivors, advocates, researchers, judges, and more who met last December at the White House, and many of whom were there or in this room today. Currently, we're doing more within our current funding and within our current authority. But we also have aspirational goals, and that's part of the reason we're having discussions with Congress. We're also greatly encouraged by the President's 2014 budget that includes $20 million to allow the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Justice to reach more victims, including domestic victims, and to reach survivors with the supports needed to rebuild their lives. We envision the creation of a sustainable, comprehensive, and trauma-informed victim services network where victims of human trafficking are identified and provide services 
the services they need, they need to recover and be, rebuild their lives. The draft of the Strategic Action Plan is now available online for public comment until May the 24th. And if you haven't already read it, I encourage you to do that and provide input. Uh, it is our hope that once that's done, we can reach out. We're now meeting weekly uh, over the next 10 weeks uh, with federal agencies across the board in analyzing public comments, in analyzing new information to try to refine that plan and have it finalized by September. I believe that implementation of the plan will strengthen Victim Services Network where, over time and much work by all of us here, we have the ability to identify victims of human trafficking and the ability for them to access a full array of services needed for their recovery. As part of these efforts, the federal leadership will continue to encourage state, tribal, and local leadership to increase their engagement and their commitment. And I have to take a hat on to many local communities, to many states, to governors, to legislators at the state level who have joined the fight. Improved coordination and collaboration will improve our efficiency, our effectiveness, and our comprehensiveness of services. Private businesses and philanthropic and civic leaders will be engaged in order to bring the full expertise and resources of civil society. Services provided will be culturally appropriate and trauma-informed. Survivors will have the support they need in order to build safe and healthy lives. The plan really has four basic goals. First, to increase guidance, collaboration, and civic engagement at all levels. Second, to increase awareness and understanding of human trafficking through targeted training and technical assistance, coordinated public outreach campaigns, and strengthened research. Third, increase victim identification and expand the availability of services for victims by building capacity for first responders, leveraging partnerships with related fields, and removing system barriers for access to services. And fourth, improving outcomes and promoting effective, culturally appropriate, trauma-informed services that improve the short and long-term health, safety, and well-being of victims, including identifying promising practices and tools and promoting health and independence. Today, I'm pleased to announce the release of a series of information sheets to raise awareness of what we currently know about the intersection between the child welfare system and child trafficking. Included are case examples and vignettes that child welfare professionals have, have come across. We've also included 10 promising practices around the country serving victims of child trafficking and commercial sex exploitation across the country to really help spotlight those programs so they can be replicated. As we roll out information sheets and continued guidance, we're seeking opportunities to carry these messages forward into more communities, more conferences, more training sessions across the country. Child protection workers are in a position to take the lead on this issue since they are likely to come in contact with at-risk youth. Judges have so much responsibility. I've talked to some judges who basically have indicated, until I got some training, I really didn't know what questions to ask. And I remember one judge in Miami saying, I guarantee you that I've had a runaway in front of me that I didn't know had been trafficked and I didn't respond appropriately. And just as we are working closely with runaway and homeless youth centers, with child welfare agencies, with protective investigators, with case managers, in our, in our efforts to reach out and serve victims, it is clear there's also a connection with domestic violence. Mm -hmm. By working with shelter providers and domestic violence coalitions, I believe we can amplify our efforts and augment our capacity. I've told people in my agency, I no longer want to hear we don't have the resources. Let's use whatever resources we have to make things happen. 
Today, there really is so much going on at the federal, state, and local level to combat slavery in its modern form. A great deal of work is being done to bring victims out of the shadows and regenerate their lives. And though we need to do much more, I know that, much, much more, I think we can honestly say that never before have so many people worked so hard to combat humanity's oldest enemy. I think the credit for this goes to the president, the Congress, to governors, to mayors, to state legislators, but I will tell you that the lion's share of the credit must go to the many advocates and provider organizations who've come together on this issue, who have said we will no longer be silent. This dynamic really has never existed before. There is more to do. So I ask you to participate in the development of the National Strategic Plan. I ask you to reach out in your own communities to engage not-for-profits, not to engage judges and lawmakers. As President Obama pledged in his speech at the Clinton Global Initiative, our fight against human trafficking is one of the greatest human rights causes of our time. And the United States will continue to lead it in partnership with you. The change we seek will not come easy, but we can draw strength from the movements of the past. For we know that every life saved, in the words of that great proclamation, is an act of justice worthy of the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sheldon. We have a few minutes for perhaps two questions before we close down this segment of the agenda and move on with the next panel. So I welcome anybody from the audience. We have two microphones, Jenny and Margo, holding them up high. So please don't be shy. Uh, we have the four distinguished presenters to my right. So please feel free to ask a question. We do have one there. Please, sir. Uh, John Shimano, National Foster Care Coalition. This is just kind of a more a technical question. The information sheets you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, how are those being available? Or? I think they're in the room. Oh, they well. might be en route. Oh. So before you leave, we will make sure they are on the table outside. And please collect we one on your way out. We want to make sure they were right. So we're putting finishing touches on before we came over. But, okay. but they are out. And we'll They'll wait. also be available on our website. Okay. And they're available for um, mass producing if, if you have budgets to do that. <laughs> Anybody else? Please. So I'm Melinda Javingo from Youth Care and I run a program for these um, particular young people. And I wanted to just thank Malika and Jatine um, in particular because what struck me in your remarks, um, I mean, I, we talk about criminalization, we talk about not being able to, to have young people um, safely report, but I just really got the like overwhelming, and, and um, Assistant Secretary Sheldon as well, that all, we have put the burden on the child to carry the crimes of others. And I, that just like hit me like a, a, a two by four just now when you were speaking that you didn't report and so many young people have to carry the victims of the repeated you know, child rape um, and the guilt and the shame about that. So I just wanted to thank you for that because it's one more vision and lens that I, I have now adopted. Um, Assistant Secretary Sheldon, I'm gonna say it again. Um, I also run a very successful, I mean, immensely successful ORR, Office of Refugee Resettlement Program for domestic victims of trafficking. And I would call for us to have a matching budget for our domestic victims of human trafficking um, that is run very much like uh, those programs. And, and I say that, I've said that before, and to you in particular, um, but I will say it in a different light now because I think that what we're realizing, and I'm the co-chair of the National Network for Runaway and Homeless Youth as well, is that our runaways are, are uh, vulnerable and, um, and, and, 
at, at potential victims, and we need to do a lot of work to help them never fall in. But when young people fall in, we should be providing the same kind of wraparound services that we do for our foreign victims and our foreign children in particular. And I would call for just a matching budget on that program. So thank you again. And, and, uh, and, and, and frankly, the president's new budget uh, does exactly that uh, in terms of trying to, I think there's a clear recognition, not only just on my part, but on the part of the administration and the secretary uh, of the department, um, that this domestic piece it clearly exists, uh, and a replication of what we're doing on the international side is, uh, and I think it's going to take, um, and, but, I, but I also will say, the Hill has been very responsive on this issue, and, and I, in spite of the tough times, uh, I'm optimistic on the funding piece. Do you have time for one more? Oh. Please. Yeah, hi, I'm Tim Bryceland Betts, Child Welfare League. A question for Representative Vargas. Would you tell, tell us a little bit more about your bill, um, you know, the name, the number, and uh, is it the House Judiciary Committee uh, jurisdiction? Yes, it is the House Judiciary Jurisdiction. It's, uh, we call it Hazel's Law. It's H.R. 1605, I believe, is the number. Um, uh, and we have some, some copies right back here. And uh, what, it, what it does is basically what I said before, and that is that right now, uh, for the crime of sex trafficking of children, you have to prove that there was knowledge on the part of the trafficker that the child was a child. Very difficult to do. We've been working with the prosecutors in San Diego, and they're the ones that brought this forward. I was working with trying to find out how could I help. And they say that oftentimes they won't take the minor through the process because it's very difficult, again, to testify, to get the information. Um, so instead, they plead out. And they usually plead out uh, for a, a very uh, small amount of time, the, the, the trafficker, the pimp. So what they said, what would they would really like to see is that they didn't have to prove that the person knew because proving knowledge is, I'm sure the judge can tell you, it's very difficult to do in many instances. Oftentimes, you'd, in, in instances, they had to have the, the young women uh, get on the phone with the trafficker to try to get him to say that he knew that she was underage. Very difficult to do. In, in other instances, they've, they've, uh, they've run a mic on her to get this information, so she has to go again to meet with the pimp. It's very, again, very difficult. So my law says you don't have to do that, and I, and I think it's going to go through. We have bipartisan support. Instead, the government will still obviously have to prove the crime, as, as they should, as, as, as it always should, but they won't have to prove that the person had knowledge that the young person was under 18. And instead, the government will have to prove that he or she was under 18, but they won't have to prove that he knew that. In, in, in most cases, we know that he knows it because he doesn't use it. He uses his credit card to get the hotel room. He uses his credit card for all these other things, knowing that and, and using his identification, no, knowing that she's young, that she's below the age of 18. But anyway, that's what, that's what my law does. Thank you. Thank you. I did see one hand up a moment ago. If that lady would like to ask a question, please, we'll get you a mic. Thank you. I'm Sis Wenger with the National Association for Children of Alcoholics uh, and also a former teenage foster mother. Um, I, I sit at a conference like this and I keep thinking to where were the preventive steps or the early opportunities to teach vulnerable kids the skills they need to develop their own resilience so that because most of the kids who come into the foster care system actually come from my homes, from the uh, families with addiction. So they grow up in a cesspool of chaos and victimization that may not be directly sexual, but it is victimization nonetheless. And eventually they land in the foster care system or they land in our runaway shelters. And we deal with the presenting circumstances as opposed to trying to heal the damage that has been done before. And my sense as I'm sitting here today is if we could not only do every, absolutely everything, is certainly uh, what you have said, Mr. Sheldon, uh, we absolutely must do all those things, but every time we do, I think we need to ask one more question. Was there something that could have been done to strengthen the capacity for these vulnerable kids, 
or this one in front of me, to develop resilience and be able to resist. It's, so that's my. Sis, can I, can I just make a, a point? Because I, I, I've known you for over 10 years, fought for family treatment with you. Darla Bardine is in this room as well. And, and years ago, we were fighting for family treatment um, for mothers and children, um, mothers who are addicted to meth, crack cocaine. And I must tell you, this is an extension of that work, right? Because what I started to realize in meeting so many of these girls, they were the daughters of the mothers who never got treatment. And so I do think it's so critical in, in all of the years of the different work that we have done in the child welfare community to make the connections. And so many of these girls talk about, my, I lost my mother to addiction. And because at that end, we don't have significant capacity for mothers especially and their children to provide treatment together as a family, to respond to the need at that point and provide healing and restoration for the mother and children at that point, this is another consequence that that, that daughter then goes into the system and becomes so vulnerable. We worked so hard on that whole celebrating family, whole family recovery. Ex the exactly right. And, and let me just, I, I would encourage, because we, we've attempted to address part of this in the strategic plan, but I really would encourage um, your input as we go forward. It, you know, I've, there's some innovative programs out there where mom goes into treatment, child stays with mom, yeah. uh, where, while the, so the child can get, uh, whether it's early childhood learning or what, whatever, so you maintain that bond. Uh, if you have a, 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 a woman who is mentally ill or with an addiction doesn't mean she doesn't love her child. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a disconnect uh, that uh, too often in the child welfare system we fail to, to recognize. I want to also respond to that and just thinking about the idea of teaching res resilient skills and providing opportunities. And we think about young people, peer-to-peer um, -peer mentoring and support is so critical in that because young people who have lived these experiences are so able to coach and coachable, you know, co and make coachable both ways and help young people kind of get through that and to to develop all the skills that they need to be resilient and to really process what has happened and, you know, move on for that. And so I really would encourage um, thinking about peer support, peer-to-peer -peer support as well. well. Let me just add for the sake of uh, congressmen here, um, just let's take a look at the structure of the financing of the uh, of the child welfare system. Mm -hmm. um, it really is structured to do just the opposite of what these folks are talking That's about. Okay. The, 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 the system prioritizes or incentivizes separating families rather than preserving and putting families together. And, and I think Congress needs to take a close look at that. Absolutely. Okay, we're gonna have to cut it off there. Thank you for that discussion. Please help me thank Mr. Sheldon and the speakers before him. Thank you. Okay, we're going to power through. If you do need to uh, visit the restrooms or just out around the corner here, we're going to transition to the next panel. So I'd ask them to take the front stage as this group exits. Um, I'd also like to point out that there's still some food and refreshments for those of you that need some nourishment or some hydration. Um, and there also may be a few seats that are still available. So if you happen to have one next to you that's open, if you could just raise your hand if there are seats next to you that are open for folks in the back. Yeah, there are. There are some up here. Please. Let, let me let me mention it to Catherine too. Thanks, you know, Sarah. Thank you very work. much. Appreciate it very much. Oh, so you know, we're the ones who are working with you guys for the Judicial Institute on the training. While we're getting transition to the next panel. I look forward to seeing you. One for Tony, right? But still, um, I really appreciate you recommending me. Well, we really in your remarks today. Really good. I mean, I really think they just don't sell one of the right Unfortunately, I do not have a good day. We are making some progress. No, you are. Okay. All right. Are there any other judges? Slower than I would like. Uh, you know what? Um, you know, if you give me some information about that, I will. Yeah, we can.
I'm giving the Your Honor? committee now. Okay. Judge, thank you. Hey, George. Good to see you. Good to see you. When are you headed back? Uh, actually, my wife and I are headed up to uh, Bucknell in Pennsylvania for our daughter's graduation. Oh, thank you. That's wonderful. So, you get out of here. right? Yeah. 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 Are they here? Oh, they're I'm going to try to get the room. I was, I was trying. I was trying. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. 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 Can I ask everybody to please take your seats? Oh my gosh, we're just like being. Thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and get the panel situated. And while we're doing that, if I could have everybody please take your seats, I'd appreciate it. I'd just like to introduce Senator Blumenthal's Chief of Staff, Lori Rubiner. Many of you know her quite well. She's been working in this field for a number of years. She's going to go ahead and offer a few remarks and then introduce our moderator. Thank you very much. We're going to get going here. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm very excited to say there are over 200 people on the webcast watching us live. So we're live on TV, which is very exciting. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I, I especially want to thank um, Jenny Wood and Joel Cohen, um, who just have done a spectacular job of putting this together. Um, I said to Joel a couple months ago, Joel, we have a problem with um, trafficking in the child welfare system. I really want our caucus to focus on it. And then all of a sudden, there was this. So um, he and Jenny put this together. I'm very grateful to them. I also want to um, thank a couple other people, the Casey family um, programs who helped us with this tremendously, both financially and, um, and emotionally and in all kinds of ways. They've, they've given us their support. Um, and uh, D Dr. Sheldon, thank you so much. Um, it's just always great to have you here and um, to have you, your wisdom and your focus on this issue has been tremendous. Malika Sadasar, we can't, we can't do anything without you. Um, it's just wonderful to have you here. Um, I um, also am very grateful that we have a very special guest here from Connecticut. Um, and I'm gonna, I, it's um, my, uh, I get to embarrass her um, because some of the best practices that you're going to hear about today are based on um, the successful approach that's been developed in Connecticut. And I'm just extremely proud um, that uh, our commissioner, Joette Katz, um, for her leadership in the Department of Children and Families, and she's represented here by Tammy Sneed. Um, and Tammy um, was honored earlier this week um, at the Center for Children's Advocacy Annual Champion of Children's Awards. Um, they recognized Tammy for her extraordinary commitment to improving the lives of children involved in the state welfare system and reducing girls' involvement with the juvenile justice system and preventing the sex trafficking of the most vulnerable youth. And so I just want to thank Tammy for her tremendous commitment to this issue and to girls in the juvenile justice system and to everything that she has done for our state. So thank you, Tammy, for, for being here, <laughs> for everything you've done. And now I have the extraordinary honor of introducing a very dear friend and a leader in this issue, um, Jeanette Pai Espinosa, um, who I have known for a very long time and who has taught me much of what I know about girls who are truly on the margin. Um, Jeanette is the president of the National Crittenden Foundation, um, which has for the past 130 years been empowering girls and young women at the margins of society. She is also the co-chair of Girls at the Margins, um, an alliance along with Malika Sadrsar, who we heard from earlier today, which works to elevate girls' voices into the national policy debate. There really isn't anybody who has better experience, more wisdom, and more heart to put into this issue, so it's my mm -hmm. honor to introduce Jeanette. Thank you. Good almost afternoon. Oh, that's loud. Um, so now, if you're all ready, we're going to talk about belief, hope, coming together, and what works. Uh, and before I introduce our esteemed panel of women warriors, uh, I thought it would be appropriate for us to, again, 
uh, get back in touch with the voice of uh, survivor. So I'm going to read you a very short poem that was written by a young woman who was receiving services from Crittenden Services in Southern California to help her exit the life. And this is her story. I used to ball up in a corner and cry and cry and cry. I used to run the other way or stay around and bleed. But tools in my toolbox is what getting safe gave me. Unwanted touch and beatings? No, I'm not a victim anymore. Jabs, kicks, and elbows and more? No, I'm not a victim anymore. I don't look for trouble anymore, but if it finds me, I got tools in my toolbox now. So if you're a horned dog predator or just an idiot jerk, looking to do something stupid just for the perks, your best bet would be not to target me, because I refuse to be a victim anymore. No, not me. I have tools in my toolbox now. And I want to thank everybody who believed in me, everybody who helped me fill up that toolbox, because it is possible. Just look at me. So with that, I'm going to introduce very quickly our esteemed panel. Um, You've all met Tammy. She's probably been embarrassed enough, so I won't embarrass her anymore. <laughs> Tammy Sneed is Director of Girls Services, the Department of Children and Families in Connecticut. Audrey Morrissey is Associate Director of My Life, My Choice in Massachusetts. Jocelyn Baker is the Project Manager, the Department of Community Justice, Multnomah County, Oregon. Yay, Oregon. <laughs> Dr. Melinda Giovengo, who's Executive Director of Youth Care in Seattle, Washington, and Judge Angela Ellis from the 100, 315th Juvenile District Court in Harris County, Texas. So the purpose of this panel really is to discuss tools, best practices, innovative approaches that really can help us all develop multidisciplinary collaborations in terms of strategies, services, uh, and supports in our local communities. And what the work of this distinguished panel really shows us is evidence that we know a lot about what works. We still have more to learn, but we certainly know a lot about what works. Um, so the point is not that you feel like you have to know everything, but that you get started if you haven't already. And with that, I'm going to ask Tammy to begin. We've tried to reserve about a half an hour for questions and conversations, so please hold your questions till then. Good morning. So I'm grateful to be here today. And I'm here as the voice for Connecticut, the voice for the girls. And I'm fortunate enough to be representing DCF. Um, but I will tell you that this project that DCF has taken on started several years ago, well before um, I got involved. And it, it develops on a daily basis. We're always learning something new, and we're always revising and editing our current work. Um, so I'm going to attempt in the next few minutes to summarize what we've done over the last few years. Um, but just know that we have a lot more work to do. And um, the more we can share, the, more, the quicker we're going to get there, both as a state and as well as, an, an, as a nation. Um, we started our efforts primarily in 2008. And back then, our director of multicultural affairs got a call that um, there was going to be a raid, and they expected that we were going to have some international young people picked up, and that the Department of Children and Families had to respond. Um, young people, um, international victims, were never picked up. But what we also learned around the same time is that our young people, our girls in our system that were running away, were being exploited. So. Getting that information as far as what was happening regarding sex trafficking internationally and then learning what our own young people in Connecticut, from Connecticut, were experiencing, it led us to move rapidly to start to respond to this critical issue. Um, over this time period, we've done a, a few key initiatives, and I, I'm going to highlight them because I hope they're helpful to individual states. Um, first and foremost, we developed a protocol and that protocol continues to be revised. The more we learn, the more stakeholders we get to the table, the bigger this protocol gets. But that protocol has been a roadmap for us on how to respond to victims as we get calls. Our care line, our hotline, um, has specialized codes for um, victims of domestic minor sex trafficking. Um, they worked very hard on that. There was some significant training that took place, and we, at this point can accept a case even if the parent or guardian is not the alleged perpetrator. So you heard earlier that one of the challenges is when the pimp or the john, um, the abuser, is not the caretaker. 
Um, we often, most states cannot accept those cases. We now accept those cases. And that is not legislatively mandated. That is a commitment from the department. Um, and we mentioned the commissioner earlier. Our training, we have a incredible lead trainer at DCF as well as multiple trainers. And we really took it um, to a, a, a a pretty impressive level. We have three days of training, the last one's in development, on domestic minor sex trafficking, and all of our child welfare workers um, in the state has been trained, as well as the majority of our providers. So day one is a 101, six hours on the basics, day two is on the demand side, and day three will be on the response, and that should be done in the next few weeks. We also developed a very short two-hour training that we go out into the community. We have um, folks from all of our regional offices trained. So when churches and when schools and community groups want to hear about this issue, or we want them to hear about this issue, we have plenty of folks to get out there and do the training. We also have a two-hour post-certified training for police officers. So they actually get credit hours. And we just finished training about 500 officers in one area of the state. And we have numerous trainings um, scheduled and will be scheduled in the near future. So, and uh, finally, we are working on another Train the Trainer project to expand that resource. In addition, and Audrey's here, but Lisa Goldblatt Grace has come to Connecticut and has also provided specialized training to our state. Um, another initiative that you may want to think about is the coordination of a team to uh, address domestic matter sex trafficking. We have our heart team, our human anti-trafficking response team. That team is co-led by Bill Rivera and I. He's our director of multicultural affairs, and we um, have brought in multi-disciplines. We have um, psychiatry, we have medical nursing, we have clinical services, we have community providers, and we have our Office of Vic Victims Advocacy all at the table. And that team meets every six weeks or so, and we review every single case that comes into the department. Prevention and intervention. We heard a lot about, you know, what do we do ahead of time? And I will tell you, um, we are using, and Audrey will probably talk about it, the My Life, My Choice curriculum. And what we have found, although it, it I, and Audrey again will tell you, it was primarily for the prevention piece to start to educate young people. We have rolled this out at all of our congregate care programs in Connecticut at the, the residential treatment center level. And what we have found is that it's becoming an intervention. It is helping us identify young people. Typically by group anywhere from three to five, girls will start to see themselves as victims and they will disclose. Initially, there's a lot of shame involved in this. Um, there's a lot of fear. The girls often do not see themselves as victims. Actually, most of the time, they don't. This curriculum has allowed those girls to start that journey to healing. We now have practice guidelines. So we talked about the protocol. We talked about the heart team, the training. Um, Prevention, which primarily has been my life, my choice. I do want to also say that Love 146 does a lot of training for us um, across the state. But we also have practice guidelines, which was developed by our, um, our lead psychiatrist that's on our heart team. And that really provides a roadmap to respond to every individual case from medical needs to um, clinical assessments to treatment interventions. So we have just recently finalized that with the input from all, all of our regions. So finally, I want to tell everyone, and I know this is not always the popular statement, but I think it's really important. Um, this is our responsibility. Now, the department has not received any new monies for this initiative. We believe for a number of reasons that this is our responsibility. Many of these girls, most of these girls and boys are known to our system. But even if they're not, mm -hmm. this is abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and we feel the need to be able to respond. Would I love to have some money and do some additional services and programming? Absolutely. But we have to get started somehow. Um, finally, in regards to our successes as a state, I think um, the areas I can highlight is we have an increased number of identification. Now, normally when you're looking at outcomes, you want to see that number go down. 
We know the kids are out there and we're finally starting to identify them. Uh, we have a knowledgeable workforce that's very compassionate to this population. That was a challenge initially. When we do police trainings, we walk in and the lens usually of the police officer is prostitute. We walk out, our goal is for them to say she is a victim. We talk to the girls, we talk to them as survivors. Collaboration with law enforcement, uh, particularly FBI, has been tremendous. Um, we go hand in hand with them, we work cases with them, and they always call us if they intend to do some sort of raid so we're prepared to respond to the young people. So again, I just would like to put the plea out there that even if you don't have the resources, that, that you do start to think about this issue in your state. Um, my colleague was talking to another state last week, and some people will ask me, what's the most important area to focus on? And you really can't just focus on one area, and that's why we're talking about the heart team. If you develop an identification process, you're gonna identify the kids, and then what do you do? If you develop a service system, and you don't have the kids to move into that service system, that's not gonna be very successful. You have to just take it on. Um, we never received any money for any new programs. Our main focus to get our provider community ready was train the current providers so they can respond to these kids. Again, some additional money someday for some <laughs> special programs, absolutely, but it's not an excuse. Thank you. Morning. Good morning. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. It's exciting to see the expertise and the experience on this panel. I'm here as the Associate Director of My Life, My Choice, a program of Justice Resource Institute. Since 1973, Justice Resource Institute has been a leader in programming for vulnerable populations with a social, social justice mindset. And one of the things that I do want to touch on is that our Department of Children and Families in Massachusetts was the first in the country to acknowledge that these are our children. And as, as you've heard, girls who have survived commercial sexual exploitation come with a complicated array of service needs. The vast majority of girls that we serve meet the diagnostic criteria for PTSD their trauma is complex and chronic, and they come, <clears throat> excuse me, and they come with more fundamental needs that must be paramount to what we offer, belonging, connection, and caring. They also come with a tr tremendous amount of resilience, warmth, humor, and leadership. It is this that is the crux of our work, that, that our services must harness and build on. With that in mind, I want to make three key points in regards to the services for exploited youth, education, training, and connection. When it comes to education, girls in our child protective services systems are disproportionately at risk for recruitment into the sex industry by pimps who prey on the vulnerabilities of our young, young and most marginalized girls. They know where every group home and every residential treatment center is in our country and troll around looking for a girl who lacks consistency, connection, and hope. Young people today have been fed a media diet that tells them that the sex industry is glamorous. That you can have all the material, all your material needs met, that real love can be found as part of a a stable of women surrounding surroundings met, that real love can be found as part of a stable environment for them. Girls are conversely and confusingly taught that prostitutes are nasty and choose the life. Girls deserve an honest message about the realities of the commercial sex industry and who is really making money at whose expense. 
Girls have a right to learn how to tell the difference between a person who really likes you and one who is seasoning or grooming you for exploitation. At My Life, My Choice, we use our unique 10-week session curriculum to reach girls in group homes, schools, juvenile justice facilities, community-based agencies. We see shifts in their ability to reduce the risk of their own victimization or to prevent themselves from being re-victimized. Our group work model is being replicated in 21 states around the country. This fundamental educational and therapeutic model should be standard for girls in the child protective care systems. Training. Training is key to effective service provision. In order for our child protective services systems to, to be responsive to exploited youth, they need first and foremost to understand that these are victims, not delinquents, not promiscuous teens, not girls gone wild. And third, they need to understand what to do once they identify a girl. How do they respond? What is their role? We often talk about the need of specialized services for this population. This is ideal and critical. However, we all know that the kind of funds needed to provide specialized services nationwide simply don't exist. <clears throat> Training can take a good program from all girl, for all girls in the child protective service systems and make it a great program that can support, serve exploited girls with expertise and understanding within a coordinated multidisciplinary response. Further, training can carry CPS workers to a new place in which they are screening and responding appropriately. It is these CPS workers along with law enforcement and other providers that make the referrals to our program. When it comes to intervention services for girls we have experience ex who have experienced exploitation, if you remember one point from today is that we need to invest as much in recovery as we do in rescue. Removing a child from a bad situation, placing them in what we believe is a better one, and then moving on simply doesn't work. Recovery from exploitation takes time and long-term consistent support. It takes real authentic connection. As I stated earlier, girls have needs that must be met in their recovery journey. This includes intensive case management, youth development programming, medical care, legal services, education, and job training, mental health services, and of course, housing. Any model of service delivery must be focused around building connections between exploited girls and caring adults. With this in mind, at My Life, My Choice, we have developed a survivor mentoring model in which we have been, which we have paired these children with women survivors who were recruited into the commercial sex industry who have now become productive mem members of society. And we understand that recovery takes years. Most of the girls we serve are in the custody of the Child Protective Services system. Our model is based around consistency. Once paired with the girls, our mentors will visit her wherever she is placed. Without this service, girls get moved between programs, detentions, hospitals, foster homes. With each move, she loses any supports and connections that she had that she had made. While there is a role for every caring adult in the life of an exploited girl, survivors are uniquely able to decrease a victim's sense of isolation and support <clears throat> and be able to build a new life for herself. Survivors can build trust faster than anyone else. And this leverage, this trust to help a girl use other supports placed in her life. Further, our mentors can communicate hope in a way no one else can. Survivors can demonstrate a life of after exploitation while challenging is rewarding and full of humor and caring in life. This model is cost effective as it reduces runs, reduces re-victimization, and maximizes existing resources. Exploited children throughout the country have a right to assess, to have a right to have access to this model, and yet funds are scarce. 
We are one of only three programs in the country receiving OJJDP funds to support this type of model. This is a fraction of the children who will need this service. And I'm just really grateful to be here today. I'm grateful to be the first survivor in Massachusetts to mentor this population. And it has been very rewarding. And over the years, my life, my choice is now just celebrated 10 years. And we have developed quite a few leaders, girls who have gone from victims, who have been in our groups, uh, who are now leaders, and who are out in our community making a difference. So thanks. Good morning and greetings from Portland, Oregon. I'm here on behalf of a large group of dedicated people. I'm going to talk to you. Um, it's hard to, at this point to really find my niche because there's so many experts in the room and the work is just amazing. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a local response. So we've worked in Multnomah County, which is about a half million people um, home to Portland, Oregon. Unfortunately, dubbed by Dan rather early on is porn land. So um, media can help, though. That was a good way to really get some attention. Uh, we started in about 2008. And like many of you, already serving these kids, already recognizing these kids, and doing that grassroots um, collaboration where you look over and you say, are you working with these kids? And what are you doing? Because we're having a hard time. So child welfare and the police and sexual assault resource center and people in our community, the homeless youth programs at Janus Youth, already working with these kids and already struggling. Fortunately, at that point, some funding came down from OJJDP to do a collaboration grant. And we were able to uh, really kind of take it up to another level. Um, from the moment that the police meet this young person who's been victimized, and the various service providers all come together to help and restore the health and the dreams and the well-being of this child. In our community, a core team then wraps around that child and provides shelter. So first of all, like really recognizing um, her basic need. Normally, actually, even before shelter, what is it? It's food. Mm -hmm. She might have $1,000 in her pocket, but she can't spend that money, and she's starving. So starting there, start moving on to shelter. Um, Every day we're working better to identify and support victims, to hold the exploiters and the, pim the pimps and buyers accountable for the heinous crimes that they perpetrate against these children, and engaging the community in how they can be helpful and sometimes harmful. So really guiding us all towards how we can work together. Um, I want to say something about the importance of language, and I don't think you can say enough on this topic, but there's been a lot of discussion about vulnerable victims and prevention programs, which are so important, and I'm not saying they're not. But um, Janae, in your story, um, we need to talk about rape culture mm -hmm. in this community, in our country, mm -hmm. and why. So when we're promoting prevention, we need to do that. We need to talk about this is not a women's issue. Mm -hmm. This is a men's issue. I'm sorry to the men in the room, but men, and I know you're our allies, so I'm glad you're here. But the men and boys who rape girls, men, women, children in our country, and the way in media and music and TV it's promoted, and that there's these victims. So yes, prevention and saying no, but then when she says no, you stop. So I just have to say that because it was, I was about to pop out of my seat. Mm -hmm. um, and the link between pornography and this issue. Mm -hmm. You know, we haven't heard that word yet today, but I'll be the first to talk about pornography. Um, and the pornography and how it's gotten so violent and so user-focused and so victim-focused and how um, teen is the number one search item. And recognizing that. Mm. And not saying, well, I don't use porn, but I know someone who does, but it's not my thing. It's addictive. It's violent. It's misogynistic. And there really has to be some attention to how it's allowed to be so accessible, how our young children, your ch young children, my young children are getting their sexual education from pornography, right? We all got it from talking to our friends. When our kids talk, they have the internet with them on their smartphones. It's incredibly important to recognize the link between the addictiveness of pornography. I see that, I want to do that. If there's a sex industry that involves any kind of choice, people are saying, the, you know, the reports of sexual assault, the reports of people coming, buyers coming and saying, I saw this on pornography, I want to do this to you. I've paid this money, I now have the right, you have no choice. So that violence that's visited on these children, I just uh, need to say about that. 
Um, so some steps that we took in collaboration, um, knowing the people in, in the programs in your community that's already working on this issue, right? So you watch a video, you see something, you learn about it, you think, I'm going to take care of this issue. Okay, slow down. Mm -hmm. Who else is already working on it or should be working on it? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really important step. What about things like the crossover youth model? What about things like juvenile detest detention alternative initiatives? These are things that we've invested millions of dollars in. Let's build on those because these kids are there. Right? So when there's not services and we all feel really stretched for money, and I work for, for juvenile justice, and it feels like maybe we have a little bit of money, let's not criminalize her and say, I'm sorry, I know you're a victim, but if I can just adjudicate you, mm. if I can just get you services, that's what we actually call it. Mm. But we all know what it is, right? It's criminalization. And we know that it's coming from a good place. It's really well intended that we're scared for her. When we're not serving her, she's being raped. The police are going out. The vicarious trauma of the first responders working on this is amazing. So the instinct, the parental instinct, the good intended instinct to lock these children up, to keep them safe, to not let this happen to them again, how do we balance that? that the mandates to protect these children with what we know in harm reduction and what we know about stages of change and we know about what happens when we force someone to do something um, and how maybe we're replicating what they've already experienced. Um, good ways to get people involved, film nights, awareness sessions, media, again, Dan Rather calling Portland Pornland, not our favorite thing, but sure to get a lot of attention. Um, looking on Backpage, people say, yeah, this only happens in Portland, it doesn't happen anywhere else in the pleasant state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. We've had law enforcement officers post an ad that uses language about, maybe this is a, it's a decoy ad, no picture, some language about young, fresh, new in town, some key words in the industry. 1,200 hits in one day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do that in your community. Work with your law enforcement. You can see if it's happening. It might happen different in your community that happens in Portland. Maybe it happens at truck stops. Maybe it happens at strip clubs. Um, so thinking about this problem is chronic, not acute. So having a large context, keeping an organized framework, thinking big. So I really loved how um, Tammy said about demand and re, you know, reduction, prosecution, I mean, we've got to talk about the predators in this. We've got to talk about the men that are buying these children and the people that are selling these children. In Portland, what we've started to see is when you can really shift the power balance and she really starts to feel safe, you will get prosecution. We just got a life sentence on a pimp. We got a 25-year sentence on a pimp. The 25-year sentence, we had so much information because these guys like to brag, mm -hmm. she didn't even have to be in the room, which was, she couldn't be the, at that point. So you can do successful prosecution. Um, you can work with child welfare. Our child welfare has been amazing in Multnomah County. Our hotline staff are trained. We have a specialty unit. Um, that's really a hallmark in our community is specialty units. Police, rape crisis center, homeless youth center, um, child welfare, mental health and addictions, broad-based understanding about the issue, but specialized, culturally competent, really understanding what this kid is up against. Um, working with the community members, giving them a meaningful way to be involved. So these therapeutic foster homes that we need, working with um, the faith-based community and Rotary and Junior League and all these other partners that are so eager once they know to help, and if not guided, may go out and rescue people off the track, which is so not helpful. So mm -hmm. giving them, telling them, mm -hmm. this is really what we need you to do. Stay in your lane. Cops, be the cops. Be really good cops. Be really good rape crisis advocates. And community, be really good at supporting, donating, talking. Have those hard, icky conversations. When you're talking to people and they're saying something about, oh, we're have, going to a bachelor party at a strip club, talk about why that's wrong. Talk about the exploitation that happens in that setting. Um, wow, okay, I have like one minute left. Um, we've passed a lot of laws in, in Oregon. That's definitely important. Working with your prosecutors, talking to them about where they have gaps, where they're up against it and they can't prosecute in the way that they want. These things about I didn't know she was under 18, um, really being collaborative. Uh, probation and parole. So a lot of these pimps are on supervision. I work with probation and parole understanding how they have a lot of, you know, different law enforcement have different abilities to get into people's lives. And when you're on pro probation and parole, they can get into your life and they can learn things about you. Training your staff to recognize child pornography, to recognize postings, to know how to act on that and to know how to be part of a law enforcement task force so that you can really successfully, that's how we've successfully prosecuted. And knowing that pimps, when they go to jail, will keep pimping from jail mm -hmm. on phone calls. Mm -hmm. Perfect evidence. 
So again, their narcissism and their predator nature, and you just can't say that enough in the room. Um, every time we say vulnerable victim, we've got to say predator like 10 times. So um, that's all I have, and I look forward to answering questions. Thank you. Thank you. So good afternoon, almost. Uh, I'm Melinda Javingo. I'm the executive director of Youth Care in Seattle, and the second uh, uh, title I hold is I'm the vice chair of the National Network for Youth, which came into formation in 1974 alongside the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, which was enacted to stop the sexual victimization of children on our streets. So. Um, if anyone is wondering if this is a new issue for our communities, I can hear to attest that it is not. Um, I'm also, I, I spent the morning being incredibly inspired by everyone. I am um, the queen of mundane and uh, practicality and pragmatism. I've worked with young people for 34 years and have never had enough resources, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. um, and when I did, they always went away. Uh, and so you become very good, if you're in this work long enough, with figuring out how to do more with less or how to just make do with what you got. Mm -hmm. And uh, the windfalls of money and resources that come from the kind of national uh, exposure that this issue is getting now is short-lived. The public's attention is about that long. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to figure out as service providers how to make this a permanent part of the work that we do so that young people don't get forgotten again. I ran a program in 1988 through the Department of Health and Human Services uh, that was designed to help young people exit street life and prostitution, young girls. I ran that program on a three-year demonstration grant. We had tremendous results. The money went away, the program went away, and the services went away. There was nothing left when I came back to the exact same agency I worked at 25 years ago. When I came back six years ago, there was nothing except one case manager that went into detention that reached out to young people. That survived those 30 years after an enormous amount of money at the time went into making the issue um, important and, and demonstrating what would work. So when the opportunity came to grab another golden egg, um, I did. Uh, and uh, in Seattle, we became, um, we did a special s uh, study called Who Pays the Price um, by the uh, researcher that actually did the same report 30 years ago alongside me, Dr. Deborah Boyer. Um, we were on camera saying the same things we were saying 30 years ago. And uh, it got a lot of press, a lot of coverage, and so the city of Seattle invested a boatload of money, a boatload. I had one of those golden nugget programs, $750,000 a year, soup to nuts, you can do it all, right? Take those young people off the streets, United Way kicked in a few emergency beds, somebody else from the burn grant gave us another outreach worker. We have a special recovery house, we have uh, aftercare services, we have education and employment, but you know what? It's three years out, it was a pilot program and those dollars have done nothing but go down. So, did we end the program this time? We basically said no, not, not this time around. We're going to actually help keep something in place for these young people in our community. Everyone's still talking about it, nobody realizing that the golden egg is basically fried and, uh, and gone now, and now we have to continue to do the work with basically nothing uh, except the traditional resources we have. So I have been working um, with my colleagues in the runaway and homeless youth field. Uh, there are 475 programs around the country, something in every state. We have a network. What we don't have is the confidence in those programs that we know how to identify and to do short-term interventions with these young people. Why not reach in and do that? All of my staff in a program that serves 25 homeless young people a year are now trained in the sexual exploitation of children, identification, where to go for resources, and how to use our internal system to help place and keep those young people in housing. Um, so we've been able to do that locally. And at the national network, we're actually reaching out to all of our colleagues around the country to say, how can we get you up to speed? This is where our dollars should go. We have a resource, we have a fund, we should put those dollars into those 475 programs to make sure everyone can identify these young people because they have been coming through our doors for 35 years. Mm -hmm. um, what do young people need? Young people need safety. Use our shelters. Young people need identifying. Create outreach teams. 
Bring the money together to do it. If you don't have an RHY, go to o OVC. Find the money through the public grants. Go into your local uh, continuum of care and see if you can get outreach dollars for homeless people to actually start reaching these young people. Where are you most vulnerable? When you have no house, okay? Um, what do they need? Hope. They need what's next. They don't just need what's here today. So you have to have robust education and employment programs or connections to help these young people move from the identification of all they have to offer the world is their bodies and move them into, wow, I have some self-efficacy. We run a barista training program. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but all of those young people have to go to school half time and they get trained in a practical job that they can go out and earn money. They're living in a place where they don't need a lot of money. They get to save those resources for when they graduate and get their own place. People need alternatives. They need to go from where they were to what's next, and we have to provide those bridges. We can do that through the Workforce Investment Act, Department of Labor, OJJDP reentry grants. Pull those resources in for this population. Maybe the federal government could get bonus points on grants to help us as we identify these young people and the runaway and homeless young people who are at the biggest risk. Um, we need um, the opportunity to create uh, aftercare programs and those people and the, and the survivors who can come in and mentor. We need waivers when you're trying to get a license to have survivors work with us because right now in a licensed program with the kind of criminal histories that survivors bring, they're not eligible to be part of our staffing. We need some waivers. We need uh, exceptions to administrative policy that allow young people who are trafficked and in the child welfare system or are coming out of detention to be able to be placed in a runaway and homeless youth program. Right now they cannot have a direct placement if you are under state custody dependent or coming from uh, juvenile justice. That is ridiculous. I have a grant to serve CSAC kids, particularly in the runaway and homeless youth world. I can't take a kid referred by DSHS or CPS. That makes no sense. No sense at all. We need to make some practical changes to make a difference. Um, and I think last but not least, there are a lot of old dogs out there and we need to teach them new tricks, right? So one of the things that Youth Care did to fill that space where a young, people walks out, a young person walks out of their home and walks into the homeless world or the predator world or the bus stop where we know that these predators hang out, how about National Safe Place? We turned every metro bus in our system, uh, 1,700 into National Safe Places. When a child gets on a bus, they see this yellow placard, they can ask the bus driver. All the bus driver does is make a radio call one of the local RHY programs that we've created a collaboration with will meet that bus wherever it is in 45 minutes and retrieve that young person. So if they ran away because they hate broccoli tonight, tomorrow they're not selling themselves for a McDonald's hamburger, right? So you fill the space that is allowed right now. Create communities of safety, message safety, and message them through the tools we already have. Make do with what we have by blending those resources into robust community opportunities. Call it something. If you name it, people will pay for it. I'm here to tell you. I had a half hour computer training program. I called it the Digital Bridge Academy and all of a sudden I had week long training programs. You know, we had a, um, for unattached uh, runaway and homeless youth programs in Seattle. We came together, met about eight times, called ourselves the Puget Sound Runaway and Homeless Coalition. We have tripled our local resources because we're working together and we're showing you can do more with less. Look at the Affordable Care Act. What's there to help with resources? How can you bring case management into your program and how can you make that part of your community's plan? Look at what we're already doing, bring it together, name it anything you want, and you will be able to bring partners to the table to create the kind of robust response system that needs to happen. Again, I, I, we work with law enforcement, we use prosecutors, I sit on 50,000 task force, we're all going to solve the problem from up here. My job is to solve the problem down here, and so the only way I've known to do that is to bring resources together in a very pragmatic. I also want to just give one tip, this is not easy. Mm -hmm. These young people are angry, duh, you know, wouldn't you be? These young people are not always grateful. They're not trusting. It takes a long time. They are hard on staff. I had staff balled up in closets crying one day because of how difficult the work was. The secondary trauma is enormous. It is a difficult program to run. We do not run, you know, the exceptional model, right? Because there is none. 
every day we're learning something different. Every day we're making mistakes. Every day we're attending forums like this to figure out what's the next best thing we can try in hopes of pulling together the best resources we can for our young people. So um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, think about what hope looks like in your community and how what's the pragmatic applications and pieces of hope and put together a collaboration of service providers that can actually create a robust response system. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm inspired already and also frustrated. I'm glad to know that everyone out, out there is frustrated about a similar thing, you know, to the thing that I'm working on. Uh, I am a juvenile court judge in Harris County. The largest city in Harris County is Houston. Uh, we do a dual docket, which means uh, on two days of the week we do child welfare cases. On the other days of the week we do ju juvenile justice cases. Uh, I came to this job after having spent many years as an attorney for kids in care, both in the child welfare system and also kids that have been charged with offenses in the juvenile justice uh, system. And I quickly, when I, when I came to the bench, became incredibly frustrated about dealing every day with what I knew existed before as a lawyer, but now was responsible for in a different way as a judge. And that is I'm seeing the same, you know, seeing the same families on all of these dockets. Uh, and I'd certainly represented a lot of kids who were victims of sexual abuse. We started a juvenile drug court. And every week I nagged and was frustrated because we kept screening boys in and screening girls out. <laughs> and the reasons why we were screening girls out were things like CPS involvement, mental health issues, uh, history of sexual abuse, you know, assaultive behavior. And that just seemed unacceptable to me. Why do you give less services to people who have a greater need? So uh, in conjunction with the juvenile probation department, uh, we just made a decision. And believe me, I don't think I know it all, but I think we're trying really hard. Two, two years and four days ago, we started something called the Girls' Court. That stands for Growing Independence, Restoring Lives. It is a single, gen this, this, the kernel of the program is this. It's a single gender program, all women, serving girls in an intensive and formal uh, way. We all sit at the table, this is how it looks. I'm not in the robe, we have child, we have child's lawyer, family member, great. No family member, guardian ad litem. We have a PhD, we have a, a juvenile probation officer, we have an educational specialist, we have various folks, we have folks from the Y, different providers, and we are the team for that child. Uh, the, we have the beauty of having juvenile probation officers who have a caseload of five, so believe me, they're all up in everybody's business, up, up, down, and all around, which seems to be a, a, an arrangement that actually really works. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, this is a 24-7 project, so all during the weekend I'm getting, you know, we, this, this situation happened, what do we do, where, where can we take the child? Um, I think everyone said all the important things before I got up here, but, but let me dwell on a few things that I think are incredibly important. In Texas, we deal with kids in the juvenile justice system from 10 to 17, okay? It's only recently that we've had a Supreme Court case that acknowledged that little girls, and only, I'm sorry, the age 15 and under, cannot give consent to sex. And so our Supreme Court case said, well, conceptually, if you can't give consent to sex, you should not be able to be charged with prostitution, right? <laughs> I mean, we're late to the party maybe, but we're at the party now. <laughs> uh, and and I, I do think that the language issue is incredibly important. You know, you know how much energy you get around the word prostitution? Zip, zero, skinny, fat, nothing, okay? If, if you start to change the conversation and speak about things like sexual abuse, then people, you know, people start thinking treatment, they start thinking intervention, mm -hmm. they become sympathetic. Because the idea of prostitution is a, is a ridiculous notion that's transactional, right, and, and consent-based, which simply doesn't apply to this. Once you move into talking about sex trafficking, human sex trafficking, child sex trafficking, then people are all over it. They want to help. Um, and, and, you know, while I'm all for that, you cannot move things like, in, where I live anyway, you can't move law enforcement to a different place on this issue until you change that conversation and you disentangle that language. You cannot move prosecutors to a different place until you look at that 
And I'm pleased to say that one of the founding members of the drug court, who at the time was a defense attorney who had argued our Supreme Court case, was hired back by the district attorney's office and a, a task force was created within our district attorney's office to focus on prosecuting the perpetrators. You know, that just had not been happening. You know, people had accepted the idea that that was too hard, you know, evidentiary problems, and they just didn't take it on. Well, now they are taking it on in a very organized and intense way, which I will tell you is incredibly helpful to the girls because mm -hmm. uh, the last... the kids. Well, of course, obviously, you see kids on juvenile justice cases, right? You don't take them out of their home. You don't put them into restrictive environments uh, unless, um, thank you. you, you don't take kids out of their home in a juvenile justice proceeding unless they are there in the room with you and you're talking to them. Mm -hmm. Well, we had never, and, and, the, and the reasoning was always sort of, it's bad for kids to come to court. We don't have the right facilities. We don't. We, you know, it's, it's an all-day proposition. It's very difficult for the kids to come to court, so we're not going to mm -hmm. do that. Well, it, it's been an incredibly powerful thing to bring the kids to court, not just when the, they, have, they face the prospect of being incarcerated, mm -hmm. but when you're dealing with them on the child welfare docket. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of truth to power that these kids actually have. Mm -hmm. You get the robe off, you get them in, your, in, in chambers, you give them the opportunity to talk, they will tell me things that they did not tell their lawyer. Mm -hmm. They will tell me things that they did not tell their guardian or their caseworker. So that has been an additional way of identifying trafficking victims for us through the child welfare docket. Um, I think one of the most important accomplishments of the program has been that we've been able to get child welfare and juvenile probation in the same room, talking the same language at the same table coming to terms because historically, you know, there's been a turf issue. These kids are difficult. They're troubled, you know. Uh, they're not grateful, you know. They're not ready for that. And so you would have this, you would have a situation where you'd have a child in juvenile detention and CPS would just not want to come and get them. Their, their rationale was there is no immediate danger when you're in a safe place. A detention facility should be a safe place, right? You know, and so you'd have to beg beg them to come and pick the kids up. Well, now we're working on more specialized protocols so that when a referral is made to the 1-800 number and the child is in the program, that they give it a different level of scrutiny. Um, so that has been a big step forward. And frankly, our state CPS, as well as our Harris County CPS, has become one of the most important partners in this endeavor. Um, I think one of the things we have to do is focusing on what's next. What's next, uh, what we're working on in Texas is, since the two years and four days ago that we started this program, uh, pending in our legislature now is a bill that would mandate it, each county in the state of Texas to create a human trafficking court. Mm -hmm. uh, that is an issue that, no, that was absolutely <laughs> invisible at the state level before. Now, if I had my way and my preference, we would never be talking about dealing with these kids in the juvenile justice system. But in point of fact, until and unless they change the law, we will and we do. Uh, so bringing that level of recognition has been incredibly important. Uh, I also think that judges have a big responsibility, and, and many of them don't have the benefit of having had the privilege that I had to represent kids in the system. They come to the bench fresh and raw. Uh, they don't have the training to recognize victims. We have to do a more critical job of adjudicating kids when kids have been uh, charged with things like prostitution or lewd conduct. You know, it was sort of a rubber stamp thing all along the way. 
you start asking those critical judges on a plea agreement as a judge, you know, they can't get there. You know, it's not a good plea. They can't meet the elements. And so you have to challenge the defense bar. You have to challenge the prosecution up to, to rethink what it is that they're doing. Uh, and in that way, we've been able to, uh, to sort of jettison a whole lot of prostitution cases that, in my opinion, never should have been filed to begin with. <laughs> if girls are successful in completing the program, and really that just means they're safe, they're somewhere where, where we know where they are, right? We provide mentoring, we provide medical follow-up, we provide uh, mental health uh, assistance, educational assistance. If they are able to uh, respond to the treatment and not reoffend, then we seal their records. That's an incredibly important deal to these girls. Now, of course, there are, limited, uh, there are limitations to that because the state court can't order a federal agency to do jack, right? Mm -hmm. But at least on the state level, we're able to, to do things for them so that they're in a position when they go to school and some of them are, and more of them will, or when they go to uh, you know, apply for a place to live and different uh, employment opportunities, they're able to truthfully say under the law, I don't have a record of ever having been adjudicated. I don't have a record of ha ever having been arrested. Mm -hmm. uh, because the more we work on sealing issues, the more folks out there in schools and workplaces tweak the questions, right? So that it's really difficult for them truthfully to say uh, that, I haven't been involved. Um, and, and one of the things that Jocelyn said is one of, one of the biggest issues that we are working on and trying to overcome, and that is the notion of adjudicating for services. You know, it's immoral, right? It's wrong. And we should never, never adjudicate for services. We need to be working really hard on that partnership between probation, juvenile justice, and the child welfare so that we rightly understand that this is sexual abuse and we rightly deal with it in the appropriate system. So um, I really appreciate everything that you're doing. It's actually, we have no additional resources to doing what we're doing. We just decided one day, this is it. You know, we, we have a responsibility and we're not gonna wait. So if the money follows, yay, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, but I would encourage those of you who are, and I'm sure you all are struggling with funding, to seize the moment. Yeah, this is this is a, a very visible issue right now. Those of us who do this work know it's always been, it will always be. You know, I, I think you just sort of have to examine what you can do with the resources you have. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to come. Can we have time for some questions? Yep. And whoa, whoa, whoa. Go ahead, back by whoever gets the mic first. Hi, my name is Maya, and I represent the District Attorney's Office Human Exploitation and Trafficking Heat Watch Program out of Alameda County. This is my boss, DA O'Malley. And we came today in large part to support all of you, especially Jocelyn out of Multnomah County. She's one of our partners. Um, we actually saw a need to coordinate coordinators on the West Coast, and so that sort of grew with just sort of a core group, and now I think we have like five plus, or six plus coordinators in Nevada, Nevada San Diego, Portland, even Minnesota, even though that's not really West Coast. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that you shared a little bit about, or one of, um, I think it was Connecticut had shared a little bit about um, have every six weeks meeting together to address cases, and I want to share one of our pro one of our five point strategy programs that we created, which is Safety Net. So Safety Net is a multidisciplinary weekly case review because we noticed that in our county we have to address um, this, you know, address identifying victims every week. And in the two years that we've been doing this, we identified close to 300. But in large part, the data we've gathered from those those cases have actually informed our practice, and that's where we connected with social services and said, hey, 40% plus of CSEC youth or at-risk youth are coming from foster care. And so from there, we've been able to develop more partnerships and grow from there. So I just wanted to share that and thank you for sharing all of what you guys are doing. It's really inspiring. Anybody want to comment? I just wanted to say about the data. Uh, we're getting ready to release under the leadership of our U.S.
those that we've identified are African American. Um, and additionally, the overrepresentation of kids with disabilities. So again, mm -hmm. these are predators. So if they feel like you're in a foster home, you're in a low-income neighborhood, you have a disability, whatever they can work to their advantage for the perks, like someone said, they will. Mm -hmm. So I just think that's important to add as well. Um, thank you for your comments. I did want to clarify the HART team, we look at cases, but we look at cases to inform our practices. Um, regarding case management, we are looking at those cases on a daily basis. As soon as those cases come in through our care line, um, they are sent to lead members of our team, and then we are providing inter interdisciplinary um, conferences on these young people. Um, so really the HART team, focuses on what we're seeing, what the trends look like, what, what our data is telling us, which is great to hear you're looking at your data as well, and then how to enhance our system, enhance our program guidelines. Uh, hi, my name is Bernadette Brown. I'm with the National Council on Crime and Delinquency in Oakland, California. I oversee an initiative on lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning youth in the, both the child welfare and juvenile justice systems there. And uh, first, I wanted to commend the, uh, the government for their strategic plan and even mentioning sexual orientation and gender identity in the plan, and we will be submitting some further recommendations. I wanted to ask a couple of questions because uh, our research director conducted the first survey in 2008 of LGBTQ youth in the system. And you know nobody's really surprised by the prostitution findings for boys, which found that gay, gay bisexual, and questioning boys were 10 times as likely to be detained for prostitution compared to straight boys. But people are surprised by the stat for girls in that lesbian, bisexual, and questioning girls are twice as likely to be detained for prostitution as compared to straight girls. So 11% compared to 5%. However, when I review programs and services and policies throughout the country, it seems that sexual orientation, gender identity and expression continue to be ignored in a lot of in a lot of what I'm seeing so I wanted to ask people on the panel two questions one if you are meaningfully implementing programs and services regarding sexual orientation and gender identity and expression in your programs and two if you are collecting any data around those identities so um, in Seattle at youth care we We've seen this problem for 30 years that a lot of the young boys were going ignored. And so our program does uh, allow for young people to come in regardless of sexual orientation or gender. So our program will take boys or transgendered young people into services um, and try and recognize the special needs of those young people especially. We also set up an uh, individual case manager, outreach worker that, went, that goes out and, and looks for the young boys and uh, transgender young people. So his whole caseload is uh, basically targeting um, the young people who are LGBTQ um, in the community that are experiencing this kind of um, horrific uh, victimization. But I just read a report that I think Kathy uh, McCullough out of Atlanta is uh, putting out where she the, the incidence of young boys uh, being uh, victimized this way is astronomical. And we just don't even hear about it because of the bias around young men being able to quote unquote protect themselves or should be able to protect themselves. And that's gay, straight, transgendered, whatever. If you're a boy, you're probably not going to be picked up, nor are you going to be um, asked the right questions to identify what's going on with you. So um, we continue to try to figure out the right programs. We have partnerships with um, a program called Allyship in Seattle that actually runs special groups for the sexual victimization of LGBTQ young people. So, um, but certainly underreported, underrepresented, and underserved. Yeah. I would just add in Portland, we opened a shelter through our homeless youth, um, through Janus Youth Programs, and we opened it in a way that it was flat funded, which was important because it was funded, we funded it 485000 a year, seven, peop seven kids, didn't matter, like if they got better, like you know they get better, they have to leave, right? Or uh, didn't matter, boy, girl, trans, LGBT. So we have individual rooms, which again is another capacity issue. So the need with this population to have individual rooms for them, what the criteria is, is if you're a youth who's been trafficked and you want help in leading that, this is the place for you. So it's at a certain point in the continuum. It's not the 
the first place to go, um, but it's a place as they're moving through their process. Um, and we did that really strategically so it was open to youth, not to any particular um, gender or sexual orientation. Thank you so much for that question because I left that group out and I really appreciate that. Yes, and uh, Justice Resource Institute a actually has a program that has just started, which was actually part of our, the grant that we got from OJJADP was to um, incorporate serving the population that you just talked about. And so where it is fairly new, but we have a um, mentor in place that is now meeting with, the, with that youth. We're beginning to work with him on going out training folks in our area about this population because we know as well as with the, the girls, with training, more referrals will come in. And so we're building on that to get him to a place where he gets out in the community. And we know once he's in the community, these children will be identified. Um, Connecticut has provided training actually through True Colors, a terrific mm -hmm. organization um, in Connecticut. And we've trained most of our providers uh, across the state. Um, but I will tell you, we're, we're concerned with the lack of identification of our males and our transgender youth at this point. Um, and we have a group that has been formed to look at this issue. We're um, looking at training. We're looking at how to assess these young people, the right questions to ask. Um, so, and actually, True Colors is at the table with us um, in that initiative. So um, stay tuned. Great. Did Becky have? Yeah, and Becky was there. Great. And you're, you're all live now. Oh, thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, I'm Becky Shipp, and I work for Senator Hatch in his capacity as a ranking member on the Senate Finance Committee. Finance has jurisdiction over child welfare programs. And in listening to, you know, to your remarks, there were a couple of things I identified that maybe uh, have a federal nexus as we look at legislating in this area. So I wanted to identify those for you, see if I'm right, and get your input on possible you know, modifications or if I've missed something. The first thing is, you know, you can't serve a girl if she's not, if she does not present with a caretaker or child protective services or child welfare, can't serve, a, uh, can't provide services to a girl if she doesn't have a parent or caretaker. So if she's in the custody of a pimp, she can't get services. Is, is that accurate or? In me most states, child welfare will not take a referral based on the fact that she is being sexually exploited by a pimp. It has to be an immediate family member or designated caregiver, and the, the pimp or, or perpetrator is not, does not have an identity. So we get referred to law enforcement. So legislatively, let's just say if we were going to legislate in this area, the Congress could say, you can take her if she is. Is it, is a, my yep. question, is a federal remedy needed or appropriate for this? or? And we, oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And absolutely. In, in Oregon, we've gone farther to, in Multnomah County to actually screen those kids in through the hotline. So the a case is opened on, we've changed the policy statewide, we've trained our hotline staff locally, and then this, those cases are screened in for a look. So, and a lot of them are already open cases, but even when they're not, um, they're screened in. So we've been able to do that on the state level. Doing it federally would be really helpful. Yeah. Right. And this, the second thing is, I, I heard that you can't put a placement into a homeless program if that uh, child has been referred to by Child Protective Service. Right. Within the RHY um, authorization, it basically, and the regs, it precludes us from taking direct uh, referrals from child welfare and juvenile justice. The reason is, is that they are so desperate for placements that they would completely eat up the you know, the modicum of uh, resource that we have in that, that, uh, in that network. But most of the young people that come in through that door are young people who have been on the run from child welfare for a very long time or have been repeatedly put into ju juvenile justice with probation officers. So having had a grant that was designated to serve these young people and then getting an audit finding because they were referred or had an open child welfare case is just contraindicated. So it, it's a very small language tweak that says an exception can be made for victims of child trafficking. And, and that closes the door so that we're not getting every child welfare case and we're not getting every juvenile justice kid that doesn't have um, uh, a placement because juvenile justice isn't doing their job. So I mean, it's about nobody wanting to pass the buck, but there's this narrow population that, child, that actually RHY was kind of designed 
uh, originally to help um, serve, and yet we can't We'd take them define, in legally. Though. We'd have to define what a trafficking. Well, that's right. And, mm -hmm. and Darla Bardine back there is the National Network for Youth working on that language right now. Is there any, uh, you know, there's lots of uh, wonderful people in this room. Uh, is there anything else that while you have someone from the federal government here to help you um, uh, <laughs> that you would like us to know or that you'd like us to take oh. back? Well, I, I want to come back to your first question because I can absolutely tell you unless you in some way make funds contingent upon changing the definitions to include kids who are trafficked and as uh, an intake criteria for child welfare where, where I am, that that's not, we're, we're not going to make significant progress because the few uh, referrals that come in for kids who've been trafficked come in under neglectful supervision type theories, which is tenuous at best in some of these circumstances. I mean, it, it could be drafted as part of your four, you know, state has to meet certain criteria to be exactly. eligible for 4E reimbursement. Right. Oh, this yeah. is when people get excited. You, you draft it yeah. as a contingency yeah. in, in that. Yeah. You hold them. I would line. say yeah. also that. That, although it's, we're grateful that the grants are coming out of BJA and OVC and they're, they encompass all trafficking, those are really hard to implement. So in our community, the people that work with domestic trafficked children, and we work with adults because we all know the day they turn 18, right, mm -hmm. the services go away and the service they're eligible for is arrest. So we work on that side and we have a robust international side that works there and we know when to connect and when those cases come together we know how to work together but to force the money to come down to build these like uber task force it forces us to do things that to take services away from the victims that need them and impede our ability to do our work we know how to work together we know when to work together there should be language that gets people to work together, but to have all those dollars attached that way, but Portland hasn't, hasn't applied. Not that we don't want the money. I mean, we'll bring us the money, but we just can't, that just, that waters down our work and makes it worse for the survivors. There's been very few grants that are directed toward the domestic victimization of children, and, and I would say children and young adults. Again, yeah. so we have no shelters for 18 to 22 year olds um, for this, you know, that, that are at exceptionally high risk. Um, and we have no, um, you know, direct service funds for services, actual services for domestic victims. And again, the inequity between getting $1.5 million for 20 beds for uh, foreign traffic victims and getting 175000 for domestic mm -hmm. just seems a little, I mean, we have a great program, mm -hmm. but it seems like those populations should be treated equally in, in, the, in terms of resources moving forward. Yeah, and taking the best practices, like we know in homeless youth that it doesn't end when they're 18, so we fund it through 25? 22. 22? Ish. Could we, you know, because we have this whole gap of 18 <laughs> yeah. to 25 year olds, yeah. so we've worked with adults traditionally in Portland around a diversion program, diverting them out of um, arrest and probation, but these 18 to 25 year olds who we're creating these relationships with, and then they turn 18, and they know they're done. The, the same that, thing happens so, in foster care. You know, they, we keep them from being killed until they're 18 and then emancipate them out of Well, no, then they just end up in the homeless yeah. youth system. But there is but, some you know. ability to, um, <laughs> to work with kids in the foster care system beyond, you know, up to 21. So there is, again, looking places. at, like, what we have and how we can get creative with what we have and then really identifying those gaps. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your question. Mm -hmm. Lucky we let her sit down. Yeah, no kidding. Okay. <laughs> we'll go here and then we'll go to the back. Hey everybody, Brad from Polaris. Good to see you all. Um, I just wanted to, to throw out a, a, a couple comments and, and, and slightly question as well. One comment was, I just wanted to highlight everyone's attention on something that um, Assistant, Assistant Secretary Sheldon said. He said they're having 10 weeks of meetings within the federal government, within the interagency, reviewing every public comment that comes in. Mm. So what that tells me is, if any one of us hops on that website and puts a public comment about all of these things that have been said, there is an interagency meeting of 20 or 30 federal officials that are going to review that public comment. And that's a rare thing. And so for the next 10 weeks, I just kind of clued in on, on George saying that and said, wow, we should flood that with public comments because there's people looking at those public comments for the next 10 weeks. So that's one thing I want to throw out there. The other thing I want to throw out there is a point about the data. 24th, that's right. But, but they're going to be then, they're then, they're then going to be reviewing those comments for the next eight or nine weeks. So I'd say get those in. The next comment I want to say is just something that many folks highlighted today. Malika highlighted it. Dr. Giovingo highlighted it. 
it's the lack of data in the field. Mm -hmm. This field, when you look at other fields, if you look at the public health field, if you look at all these different fields, people talk with empirical data. When someone stands up to make a point, they're speaking with empirical data. But in this field, we're not speaking with empirical data as much for the past 10 years. We're speaking with anecdote. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to get to a standard where it's, where it's like, if you're not speaking with empirical data about this program works and here's why and let me show you, which this panel did, but not a lot of folks in the field do, I think we can get to that point with better data, with the study about who pays locally, with the national study. But the field, I think, is still weak on that empirical data point. And so from, from a legislative standpoint, from a congressional standpoint, from a federal action standpoint, pushing the field towards more empirical data about the magnitude of the problem and what interventions work. All these four interventions on this panel have tons of empirical data about how this works and using that to speak volumes with. Another point I'd throw out there is, I think this is a dream team on this panel. And when you look at the concept of music, you have this concept of mashups, <laughs> of mashing songs up together, right? And so how can we create a mashup of the best programs that you all just described of what we're doing with the court, what we're doing with runaway outreach programs, what we're doing with the dream team and the heart team and the girls team, what we're doing with mentoring survivors, what we're doing with changing the child welfare hotline. How do we create that mashup and then model that for other states and other countries? And I, I think the HHS document of the 10 s samples is a start to that mashup. But as I was hearing the five or six of you speak, I was just dreaming of, look at this mashup between each of these programs and the strengths of all of them, and how do we roll that out in communities nationwide? And then the last thing, and I, I'd appreciate any of you all's thoughts about how to create those effective mashups in a, in a local area. And I guess the last thing I'd say is, the issue of Rolling Stone came out this week where Snoop openly admits to pimping. And there's this comment where he basically says, I was selling women to athletes. I was running a stable of 10 girls. I was doing this. And he openly admits to pimping. And I haven't heard outrage from the field mm -hmm. talking about that. Mm -hmm. Yet when Michael Vick is found for dogfighting, right. it's a national conversation yeah. on every single national news network talking about Michael Vick dogfighting. And yeah. there's federal sentences and whatnot. How can we be a field if a major celebrity is yeah. openly bragging about pimping in Rolling Stone magazine, Ooh. and the community is just silent. Like, oh yeah, he was pimping, let's move on. And so I, I think that when you talk about the glamorization of media culture and what you were talking about, Tammy, what you were talking about, Jocelyn, about what these kids are being fed, what an iconic representation of how far we have to go is when we have people bragging about being pimps in Rolling Stone magazine and silent national conversation about it. And that to me is, is pretty shocking. Um, so I wanted to just throw that out there for everybody um, about how to create a dialogue around that. But for you all, I'd love this idea of mashups and how do we build these programs and how do we take the best of what you're all doing for a national model and wanted to get any of your thoughts about that. Thanks so much. So I just want to comment that um, I'm too old to read Rolling Stone, so thank you for bringing that. I, I, I quit reading Rolling Stone a long time ago. Darn, I have to get my subscription renewed. Um, but. That's outrageous. Why isn't he being pursued by federal prosecutors, right? Because he was clearly crossing state lines and stuff like that. It's an, you know, so we will certainly take a look at that from the network standpoint. But I, I also um, just want to comment on data. Um, data is critical, absolutely. But in 35 years of working with runaway and homeless youth programs, ain't nobody put a dime into it. You know, we can't even tell how many kids are on the street. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and basically legislators hide behind that. We don't know, we don't know, we don't know. Figure it out, figure it out, figure it out. And has anybody put $20 million into figuring out what the data system needs to be? And fig Absolutely not. So the National Network has asked for that kind of money in every reauthorization. It never comes, and yet people then can hide behind the fact that we don't have the numbers to do anything. And I find that kind of shameful, to be honest with you. Yeah. And I, just the thing about mashup, I love that idea. Um, uh, there's not a lot of money for collaboration. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm really lucky. I actually, my title is actually collaboration specialist. That's pretty awesome because what you find when you don't have a collaborator is a whole bunch of people that already have jobs trying to get each yeah. other to do things and trying to move together. And oh, by the way, they're vicariously traumatized. And it's just a mess. So actually investing in collaboration. And then like Maya was saying, you know, just saying to each other, are the coordinators coordinating? 
Mm-hmm. Are we talking to each other? You know, did I have to come all this way to meet Melinda, who lives like three hours away from me? Right. So do we even have the time to coordinate in our regions? Um, and but when you do collaborate locally in Multnomah County, and this is just amazing. I've worked for them for 21 years, never seen them do ongoing funding. They just moved all of our CSEC funding, 1.2 million, jail sergeant, my position, um, advocacy, shelter money, ongoing, right? Because we built relationship and we talked to them about collaboration and about all the work we were already doing in the county and how this was in all of it. And if they didn't help with this piece, it was eroding the whole system. And at the same time, the city of Portland cut their entire budget, mm-hmm. right? So I hope you're watching city of Portland. Mm-hmm. Clearly, we need to educate. We have a new mayor there. Like there's, the first thing I thought is we missed the relationship piece there. So we've got different entities doing different things. But the power of the collaboration, it's what, I mean, if you, tr- if you explain it to a taxpayer, they're just going to look at you like you're stupid because why wouldn't you do that? So it really is good use of public funds, and it's the way to get things, it's the only way to get things done. Mm -hmm. Mashup, I like that idea. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We need a mix master, so, yeah, right? (laughs) Tammy, you had a comment? Sure. Actually, two quick comments in regards to the the collaboration. Connecticut's where they're at right now because of true partnerships. Um, Again, I'm fortunate to be the voice of everyone, but DCF hasn't done this alone. Um, Individuals hasn't done this alone. We've worked with multiple state and private agencies. We've worked with authorities. We've worked with a national organization called Love 146. Um, Our Center for Children's Advocacy um, has led the way in a lot of our legislation. So that has been, it's key in where we've come today, but also moving forward. Um, And I I wanted to make one comment in regards to the issue with the pimp culture, um, Rolling Stones. We have a new curriculum. It's still being developed. We've run through it a couple of times at our training school, but we call it Man Up. It's a 10-week group curriculum for boys, um, our most highest risk boys. And one of the main areas I talk about is pimp culture. Um, so, at, you know, as we roll that out and as we get the data um, um, in regards to its success, we will be happy to share that as well. Add that to the yeah. Got it. <laughs> yeah, and likewise, the Sexual Assault Resource Center um, yes. in Portland, when we had that little bit of OJJDP money, we asked them to do a prevention program. It's not around how girls stay safe. It's around not being involved in this culture. Right. It's about boys and girls being having their worth is in their head and their heart and their body, but not for sale. And so it's about not raising up more buyers. And it's really about media literacy, right? Because we used to fund that. And these kids, they don't want to be dopes. They don't want to be, no teenager wants to think that someone's getting something over on them. So pimp, you know, you've got Snoop Dogg over here. Who's on his arm? Girls who are having the time of their lives. It doesn't get better than this for a woman than to be on some guy's arm, you know, or having this leash. great time or on a leash, leash cuz he does leashes. that too. So it does so that's the dream that gets sold to these girls and the media talks about get it quick you can be a star tomorrow, right? So this idea if we can raise kids like I have a plan my plan is me. It's going to college, it's working hard, it's not quick, but it's good. Then when someone comes around and tells them a story in Rolling Stone or at the bus stop they're like I have a story. And you're not part of it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I want to say one thing about the Snoop Dogg thing, which I am also too old to read, so I didn't know anything about it until now. <laughs> it, but when I, when I have more than nine minutes to talk and I go around and I talk about this issue and I'm trying to sort of persuade people to rethink what this is, that it's sexual abuse and whatnot, one of the things that I've said many, many times is, you know, think it through. There is no little girl that wants to grow up to be a prostitute. Right. Okay, yes, but I'm going to have to stop saying that because last night I read a psychological on one of our kids and for the first time in my career representing, judging, anything, this little girl, this girl who's now 17 articulates that by the time she was nine and was playing with her Barbie dolls that it was her goal to be in the in sex, was to strip and to be in the sex trade because her older sister was. So it's not true. It's not true that kids don't have that, uh, that aspiration. Yeah, that they don't have that aspiration. And that really is one of the pieces we have to work on. It's not just on, uh, it's bad for people to be pimps. We also have to give those kids, as young as nine and younger, the idea that that is not a goal. It is not, it is not a glamorized lifestyle. 
So I'm dropping that from my curriculum. I'm adding in, we got to watch out for the nine-year-olds, right? And understanding the continuum, right? So when we see you can get coffee at Starbucks, you can get coffee at the local coffee place, or hey, you can go to Bikini Brew, right? Right. Yeah. And the eight-year-old girl in the car of, of a friend of mine who says, hey, what's that about? Why is that girl wearing a bikini selling coffee? And her sister says, because she makes more money. And her sister's 10. Mm -hmm. And they understand that. When we, you know, talk about we go to Hooters because they have great wings. There's a lot of places that have great wings, right? And girls can talk about, and women can talk about why they work there. Because they make more money right. when they show their bodies. So the more we marginalize women, the more we allow that to happen along the continuum. And then it manifests to, like, you're getting married, you got to go to a strip club because that's what guys do. And guys can't say, I don't want to do something to celebrate the love for this other person that involves someone else being exploited and having those hard conversations along the continuum of sexual exploitation. Back to the back. All right. Good afternoon. My name is um, Onoma Kamagwin. I'm a pediatric resident in Colorado. Um, so as a pediatrician, I get the chance to encounter lots of children, lots of adolescents um, in two different avenues, both in the emergency room and in clinic. And kind of tying in that foster care piece, there's the mandated health visits that they have. And so we always will see foster care kids in the clinic. My question for the panel is, as part of the different programs that you were doing, which sound amazing, how are you engaging healthcare providers, specifically in the emergency room and also in the um, clinics as well, in terms of recognizing these children and training of what they should do and how they should outreach and who they should call when they encounter these things? Well, in Massachusetts, we do train uh, folks in the emergency rooms. But one of the most important things uh, for a lot of folks is what's on your intake forms? What questions are you asking? So we encourage folks to ask kids, you know, have you ever exchanged sex for money, food, shelter, or ride home? And when that kid says to you, well, why are you asking me that? You know, you just say to her, well, we ask all of the girls that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's no different than when, I know me as an adult woman, if I go into the clinic with my husband, he's going to be asked to step out of the room, and they're going to ask me, am I safe at home? So just that same uh, concept of just asking that question, and what you've, have, what you've displayed to that child is, you know, even if she might not tell you then, she, she knows that this is a safe place, and if she comes back, if she doesn't answer that question now, she knows that this is a place where she can talk about this. And in Boston, uh, when we're training, of course, we leave the resources of how they make referrals um, for these, if these, particularly in pediatric clinics, to make these referrals to our program for our children. So it's all about asking the, the right questions and finding your, your resources in your area. But, but there's something about institutionalizing that kind of approach. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, we began training, training emergency rooms uh, when we took a child, a 16-year-old, to Children's Hospital um, for an emergency visit. And the nurse right in front of her asked what she did. She goes, well, I'm a juvenile prostitute, which, you know, these young people kind of just de degrade themselves, and they have very few uh, filters. Mm -hmm. and the woman put on two sets of gloves. Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. and then began to say things like, well, you know that's really bad for you, and that's really, you know, that's really, you know, evil and bad and all this kind of stuff, and started laying all this. She got up and walked out. Yeah. We couldn't get her back to go back to the doctor for, like, weeks mm -hmm. until the free clinic was open. So part of it is that we began to realize that healthcare providers aren't even, you know, when doctors say, you mean she came in for six abortions and she's only, you know, 19? Duh, you might want to think about that there's something else going on here besides, you know, safe sex. Mm -hmm. You know what, that takes me, that takes me to um, myself when I think of uh, being in the life and then when substance abuse came along and it yeah. takes me back to when I um, delivered a child who was born addicted. Yeah. And I remember they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't let the child in my room. I had to go to the nursery to feed the baby. And I remember one night uh, at 1 o'clock in the morning, the 1 o'clock in the morning feeding, I went in to feed my daughter. And I remember the nurse was holding her, and I was standing, and it's so emotional, and I was standing over the nurse. And I was the only mother in that room. So she knew it was my baby, but my self-esteem was so low. My self-worth, I couldn't say to her, give me my baby. And I remember a doctor came in, and he said to the nurse, 
is that her baby? And she said, yeah. He said, give her her baby. So it was that, you know, I'm in that place, and this, one, this nurse is like, you know, like, you're a dope fiend. Look what you did to this kid. Like, I, you know, didn't have the ability to love my own child. Mm -hmm. She dehumanized me, and my esteem was so low, I couldn't even, I had no voice to say, give me my child. Mm -hmm. So that whole judgment piece, mm -hmm. uh, when folks go in, you know, um, like I was torn down, like I wasn't already beat up because my daughter was born addicted. Now I had to be faced with the hospital staff, this nurse, tearing me down. So it's really, and our kids are real smart. They can read body language. They are taught in the life. One of the first things I'm taught is how to read people because you have to understand how to read people before you go for the approach of trying to get their money from them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to say, okay, this, yeah, I think I can work this one. So you become a master at reading people. So if I go to the clinic or anything like that and I feel judged and you're looking down on me and that happened, you know, matter of fact, I might not even go for health care again. That's right. At that point. Well, and it, I think with all the situations that are happening for these people, that might be the one thing they do see. They might get so broken, so hurt, so scared that they have an STD pregnant that they may go to the medical professional and where they wouldn't go to ask anyone else for help. And so we, and we started our training just respectfully with this is child abuse. Doctors know what to do with child abuse. They know how to react. They know how to respond. They know who to call. Um, and so just reframe, you know, framing it for them. This is child abuse. Do what you do there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, things around if she comes in with an adult and separating and the safety issues and who to call and how to get our folks there um, in those emergency rooms so we can get the advocates there immediately. And that, that's one of the reasons it would help if child welfare was the, 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 the intake line, right? So you can say, this is child abuse. You suspect this child of being trafficked. Um, you need to call CPS. Mm -hmm. Uh, because medical providers in all of those other entryways, Planned Parenthood and birth, you know, uh, contraception services, they all are seeing these young people all the time, sexual transmitted diseases at young ages, it, you know, to give them that in, which they already know, they already know how to filter child abuse. But this hasn't fallen in that category yet, and to make it in that category would really help the identification. But for us, it... Well, in Texas, they wouldn't have to worry about it because they'd close it at intake. Right. So, yeah. No, I mean, I get that concern, uh, but I think we can do some education. I, I think one of the things that we've done well is really, uh, for our kids who don't have anywhere to go from our probation system, they really don't have a home to return to, we've done a really good job of getting um, our, our CPS folks involved and uh, under, and getting the kids really to understand what their benefits are, that how long they can stay in care, the tuition waivers, all the different things. And while they're in our program, I think one of the things that's been really successful is how bonded the JPOs and the therapists and other folks dealing with the kids, even the attorneys for the kids have become. So they, they're like, you know, honey, if, if you need to go to the doctor, I mean, we will all take you. Right. We will all go. So that is one way of, and, and, and they have on more than one occasion had to be confrontational with, with service providers, but that's just one part of field education. And we had to case staff at the, you know, in the right. emergency room. We had not just go in, train, okay, you're, you got it. Right. We had to have a whole nother separate team that was multidisciplinary that sat and had some very difficult situations about really poor treatment that a transgender youth received, yep. that you know horrible, horrible things that yep. were said to young people done to young people um, while law enforcement and advocates and all these people are right there. So you can imagine what happens when they come right. in by themselves and they're pimps in the waiting room. Mm -hmm. So we had to keep case staffing that, assigning a medical social worker, a child abuse social worker, you know, really working out the kinks until finally we had actually a kiddo of a medical personnel staff and they did it perfect. And then we knew they know how to do it we got to get them to feel like every kid's their kid. Mm -hmm. right. And we've got to just keep case staffing. And they've stayed in the game. We have one place, where one emergency room where the kids go, and we have really difficult debriefs. 
So it's a matter of creating that team, not just the CPS call and have some random social worker come out. It's really about creating the team that when one is identified, like you would a domestic violence case. I mean, very similar should be treated like And when that. child welfare is there and they're seeking psychiatric placement, so they're coming in through the ER and she, she needs medical and psychiatric, then there gets to be this awful little turf war about you're just coming to place your kids. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's another, you know, there's a lot of turf. There's just so little resources, you know, helping people understand when kids do need that level of treatment, how to make that happen. So we have time for just one more question. So I'm going to try to... Push us on. Whoever can get a microphone first goes. <laughs> oh. I know a lot of you have had your hands up. Oh, Alyssa. I got the golden ticket. <laughs> uh, I'm Eliza Riach with Shared Hope International. Um, so many really good things were talked about today, and I really appreciated what Ms. Morrissey said, that my life, my choice goes to meet the children where they are. Something that Shared Hope talks a lot about is the fact that a lot of reasons children aren't getting access to service is because they're not identified. And we partnered with some great programs, including Turnaround in Baltimore and Courtney's House here in DC, that are going into juvenile detention centers and meeting kids that were never flagged as trafficked, right? Mm -hmm. But they're so high risk and vulnerable in that system. Mm -hmm. And what we found was, in these small grants, within six months, Both of these programs were either near or at capacity Mm. for the case managers we're funding. So how can we make that nexus for kids that are system involved in juvenile justice to get child welfare services if they're involved in non-related charges? Uh, Most of the kids that are working in our program actually have been charged with, they're either engaged in prostitution or, you know, on at risk, but they're, they're mainly charged with substance abuse, you know, failure to ID, criminal trespass, just all these peripheral things that would happen around um, around prostitution. And and I think one of the things that has has transformed as we've worked through this program, uh, the intake folks and, and the clinical people within probation have really changed the way they've done their assessments. They've asked different questions and more questions, and so uh, many more kids. It's like the, it's a good news, bad news thing. You know, many more kids are being identified, uh, and we don't have uh, as as much as we want in terms of resources. But you, if you start, in, in, and even as judges, you know, we're trying to share this information with other judges, uh, the different kinds of questions that you ask to identify kids. Like if, if you have this repeated AWOL uh, pattern, you know, well, how did you take care of yourself, or who did you stay with, or, you know, so on and so forth. So I, I, I think that, that if you look for it, you will see it. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and I would agree. And Eliza, uh, Shared Hope's work in that area has been tremendous. And I think that if whenever I talk to a community, I see the first thing you do is create these advocates that are in the community helping to reach in, reach in and identify these young people. I know we're out of time, but I did want to say one thing, if I could, and that I talked about these being the hardest kids I've ever served in the hardest we, program oh, I, ever, I ever served um, and the difficulty and the you know, post-secondary trauma. The reality is there is no population of young people mm-hmm. like them. Okay. They are talented and creative and joyful. And the most rewarding moment I've had in six years of working, coming back to youth care and doing this special program in the last four years was walking in a group of young people mm-hmm. um, that were sitting there coloring duckies in big fuzzy slippers, mm-hmm. laughing and playing mm-hmm. like they were 10. Yeah. And these are 17-year-old kids who had experienced things that I had never, ever wanted to even hear in my life, much less having gone through. And so, you know, for as hard as we say and as edgy and all, Mm -hmm. inside there are little kids that just want to be loved. And to create environments where they can feel like that, there is no greater service that we can do. And I I just had to say that because we always talk about how hard they are, but they are the most amazing young people uh, in the entire continuum. Yeah. It seems to be an appropriate note on which Thank to close. You. Thank you all. Did you want to say something? Okay, that was fun. Too much walking around here, though. You can't.
All right, so real quick, as folks are um, getting ready to go eat um, and uh, enjoy your day, just wanted to say on behalf of the Congressional Caucus on Foster Youth and uh, the Senate Anti-Trafficking, Human Trafficking Caucus, thank you all for coming. Um, we just have a couple of real quick announcements. For those that are um, advocates or Hill staffers, we definitely encourage your representatives or your bosses uh, to join both caucuses. Foster Youth Caucus exists on both the House and the Senate side, as well as the Human Trafficking Caucus. So uh, please uh, encourage your representatives to do uh, to join and to participate in forums like this. Uh, there are a number of bills and fact sheets. Um, two come to mind, um, one that Mr. Vargas spoke about and another that Ms. Bass has introduced, the Strengthening Child Welfare Response to Trafficking Act. You should have received a fact sheet on that. And we also have these citizen co-sponsor forms. So if you'd like to fill them out, that would be much appreciated. I just wanted to thank all of the presenters. Many of them traveled from afar. It was an exceptional discussion. Thank you for the questions and the comments from the audience as well. There are a few of you who are here, you know who you are, who are instrumental in putting this together and advising several of us on how best to go about this. You have my immense gratitude. Thank you very, very much. You dealt with a lot of emails and phone calls and ridiculous questions, but you were very patient and I thank you very, very much. Um, I also like to just thank Jenny for her partnership throughout this whole ordeal. She has been uh, just a joy to work with. So thank you, Jenny, and thank you all, uh, thank you all for coming. Bye-bye. Yeah.